So I would like to call to order the South Burlington City Council meeting of April 1st, 2019. That's no joke. And our first item is Pledge of Allegiance. David, do you want to I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our second item is instructions on exiting the building in case of an emergency. Tom? Yep, excellent. So in the event of an emergency in the room tonight, I ask you to go out one of these two doors here and meet out in the side parking lot. If for some reason these doors are blocked, we'd go out these back doors and out the main entrance that you came into tonight and still go across and meet out in the side parking lot here. And I'll make sure to sweep the bath bathrooms and make sure there's nobody left inside. Thank you. Okay. Our third item, um, consider entering executive session to discuss matters related to the purchase or conservation of land. You know, I'd like to move that the council enter into executive sessions for the purpose of discussing the negotiation of, or securing of real estate options. Uh, in the first session, we'll be talking about conservation lands. We'd like to invite in Tom Humbert, Andrew Bulldog, Paul Connor, John Binhammer from the Nature Conservancy. And in the second session, we'd like to uh, discuss the community center parcel, also inviting Tom Hubbard, Andrew Bulldog, and Alana Blanchard. Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 We don't need anything else, no. Okay, so we will <coughs> retire to upstairs, and we're hoping that this will <laughs> only be half an hour. So I'd like to call back into session the South Burlington um, City Council meeting of April 1st, 2019, and take up item number four, agenda review. Um, I would like to add, make two additions to the other business, and one is to um, discuss and have a um, potential amendment um, or proposal for a future uh, council meeting regarding um, a land purchase. And then secondly, um, a discussion and a request um, to have a joint steering committee with the school board to discuss the um, Marcotte uh, Community Center um, development issues. Are there any other additions, deletions, or changes in order of the business? Of business? Okay, moving on to number five. Are there comments and questions from the public not related to the um, agenda? Sure, Roseanne, then um, I can't remember your name. We've got two and then. Good evening, my name is Roseanne Griffin. I'm a resident of South Burlington, hello. Um, I wanted to share with the council uh, experience I had over the weekend and I know you can't respond back, but I would hope that you might consider these things important and might take up and ask for perhaps some in enforcement uh, in the future. So um, even though Green Up Day is a month away, uh, last Saturday my husband and I uh, did some litter picking upping um, along Nolan Farm Road. And uh, most of what we found it looks like they're blown out of recycling bins um, and, and trash bins. But I gotta tell you, there must have been, hun I didn't count, but hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cigarette butts. Um, that's not unusual. Uh, I haven't been out there in a while. Uh, but um, I know we have an ordinance. I, I talked to Andrew earlier today that there is a state ordinance against littering. And uh, while I think here in South Burlington we don't have a rash of people just throwing trash out of their car, I, I think it's people don't consider cigarette butts perhaps a litter um, just because of them the number of them along the, the roadsides. And if they get into our, which they will, you know, into our water supply and our ground um, soils and stuff, um, you know, they obviously will have an impact on, on the quality of water and, and our, um, what we, we ingest and what the animals eat and stuff. So um, I don't know if we've ever, if the council has ever done anything about littering or saying, you know, it, it is against the law, you know, and there are fines. I think Andrew said up to $800 or something just to maybe, most people want to do obey the law, maybe they just need to be reminded that, you know, throwing out your cigarette butts is, is also littering, so. Okay, well maybe we can do something in um, conjunction with um, Green Up Day, Green Up Day yeah. with sort of an educational outreach. 
Yes. Yeah. That's what I was hoping. Just bring his people. Because I attention. agree. I find along Heinsberg Road, mm -hmm. lots and lots of, um, lots of, lots of stuff. But a lot of cigarette butts. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah I don't think people think. Me, but I guess they don't want their ashtrays in their car dirty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I guess. Well, that's what I mean. But anyway, you know, that nicotine that gets into the ground water and the ground soil sure. is, is unhealthy. The other thing, too, though, as I was out there picking this stuff up, um, and I know the chief is here, um, is that Nolan Farm Road, as many of you know, is a one mile cut through or a connecting street between Spear and Dorset that is increasingly being used uh, as a high speed um, roadway. I, I, I walk there a lot, uh, picking up litter, I you know, had a, some close calls, um, but people routinely speed. It's a 25 mile an hour stretch, but because the road is so wide, it, it sort of invites, well, I don't want to say invites speeding, but I swear some of these cars are going 60, 70 miles an hour. Um, I mean, they're going that fast. So, you know, maybe we could just, you know, have have some patrols out there, or sometimes we used to have those monitors, so people yeah, would see we how still fast have a going. couple of them. Yeah, yeah, just to cut cut back on on that because there, there's a bike path there. There are people walking. There are people biking. Um, you you don't want any accidents to happen because of uh, the the, uh, the the you know the speed. So that's my two cents. So thank you Great. so much. Thank for you very much. Serving as our city council. The gentleman in the back, yeah. Go ahead. I'll get to you, Linus, but he mentioned his interest yeah. before the meeting began. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Mitch Sipes. I'm with the Dorset Farms Homeowner Association Board. Uh, I'm here representing the board, and like I, I'll say 14 years ago, uh, the Dorset Farms community. Um, I'm going to just say I'm a little disappointed that I'm here. There's a, an agreement that seems to have been forgotten. Um, and, uh, but seeing how the Midland Avenue connector has been pushing forward, um, I, I felt it was important that I actually come here and speak to you. Uh, and I just also want you to understand there's a little bit of angst because the city council back then, a number of years ago, didn't really treat our community very, very nicely. As I understand, this is a much better, humane, uh, city Council, so uh, um, anyway, with that said, I want to remind you that uh, a condition of the environmental court decision um, that approved South Village set aside $20,000 for traffic calming on Midland Avenue, and uh, which should actually have at this point about 13 years worth of interest, and it required the city to have a meeting with the Dorset Farms Homeowner Association um, and to complete the traffic improvement, traffic calming improvements, um, which were farthest set aside for this fund uh, prior to the opening of the connector road. Um, I'll just say that these type of uh, community outreach and such is, is typical for um, such projects. And um, I'll, I'll just also want to add that the median islands that I proposed 14 years ago, and I don't know, is any of the city council members back from that particular time? 20 years ago? Uh, 13, 14 years ago? Um, uh, 2008, so. 2008, so just right. before me. All right, so just before you. Um, so like I said, I know it's a different council and I'm appreciative of the fact that it is a, a different council, but I proposed Median Islands at that, at that time. The idea being that if you, um, and these were going to be on each side of the uh, two crosswalks, so four of them, um, which would basically allow, say, a child who mistakenly goes into the road to go 12 feet to safety instead of 32 feet mm -hmm. uh, to safety. And interestingly enough, they happen to build those in South Village, same type of thing. So um, I almost get the feeling that a lot of this, may, this, uh, this requirement uh, from the environmental court might be new to the council. So I wanted to make sure that you were aware of it and, and to make sure that, we, that the council is committed to um, meeting with the Dorset Farms community and doing the traffic improvements per the $20,000 plus interest that happens to be set there. Uh, that's, that's already in an account uh, for this. So, excuse me to interrupt, I'm sorry, just to clarify, so the agreement was that the council Well, it wasn't specifically, it was the just, it was the city was gonna set up a meeting with the community. 
Okay. To agree upon traffic calming measures. To have like a hearing, a public discussion. Uh, a public okay. hearing with the okay. with the association. I just yes. wanted to be clear who oh, we sure. were no, supposed to um, set the meeting up. Yeah, I mean, yes, I mean, okay. it was supposed to be that type of meeting, and uh, I'm here uh, providing this reminder, um, asking what the schedule, ha what your schedule happens to be. Um, were you aware of this particular um, requirement? Uh, I certainly wasn't. I wasn't, but I'm looking at Tom. Paul, are you familiar with it? <laughs> there, <laughs> bing, 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 bing. Uh, there is, I am familiar with the $20,000. Um, the board, the development review board's 2017 approval of phase three reiterated uh, that there is a condition that there be $20,000 provided to the city for traffic calming to take place. Um, I'm happy to follow up with public works and get both and council a response ASAP. Would you please, that would be great, just to find out if, if we need to have a, um, a public discussion or at least have a meeting was, and a follow through. It was basically just, um, it didn't necessarily have to be specifically the city council, but it was supposed to be somebody that, it, you know, probably that would have had a, a, a council member, maybe the planning and zoning department. Um, Paul's predecessor was not exactly too kind to that type of public improvement, uh, public comment. Uh, she cursed me out in Act 250 hearing. Um, Sorry like I said, there's a, there's a lot of interesting yeah, history with this. Paul doesn't sure. do that. Yeah. yeah. So can I, can I make a point here? Yeah. Uh, so Ireland is actually doing some construction now, right? And right. getting and that's, ready. That's what kind of necessitated. I, I, right. Know, so it'd be great if the traffic calming was designed before they built the street and the money oh, was think? spent. Yeah. And not have it be an afterthought that we install later on with another dump of asphalt for a speed hump somewhere. But, well, you know, so it, it, would, it would be a good idea to get in earlier than later. And actually, I mean, it, it should really be done. I mean, this traffic calming was set up because it was going to create this connection between uh, Spear, um, um, Shelburne, uh, uh, Shelburne Road, Allen Road. Um, it, I, I, I know this Spear is public input, yeah. but I'm not going to. Um, at the time, I actually went into a lot of detail on this, which I'll spell you for now. Uh, but basically, if you look at the uh, going from the intersection of Shelburne Road and Allen Road, and you wanted to get to uh, actually the, the intersection out here, uh -huh. Dorset Street and uh, Kennedy Drive. Um, after this connector is, ac is actually built, you can go the 10 traffic lights up Shelburne Road and, and come across I-89, or with a right on red, two lights and two stop signs, get to the same Place. And a lot and of turn, 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 little s small circle, traffic circle, right? And it's not as many turns as you actually really? think, be but basically yeah. the, the real yeah. issue is it would yeah. become, um, it does become um, right. the, direct, the direct path for a mm -hmm. lot of people. And uh, Midland Avenue was built as the 1980s uh, forgiving roadway, as opposed to the more traffic calm roadways that you see in a lot of developments. And because of that, coming from traffic calmed um, South Village to um, Midland Avenue, becomes it opens it up and people increase their speeds quite sure. a bit. And that was kind of the impetus for um, uh, why the environmental court put in these type of requirements. So I mean, that's, I mean, I, I can go on in a lot of detail. There's a lot of information that I have found out since actually uh, those hearings 14, 13, 14 years ago. Uh, but basically, the money is there, uh, hopefully with some interest, and um, and um, just since it's there for traffic calming and the well, it should be used was, for that. So I think we will follow before. up. Right, it should be done beforehand. You'll make sure that mm -hmm. Kevin. So we will figure out where that is, and I think Tim's comment of doing it before the before it's built um, certainly makes sense. Absolutely. Well, you have my contact information. Thank you very much. Great. Yes. What? No, no. Connected. Yeah. And then, then you're it. Thanks for waiting. Linus, you'll be next. Uh, good evening. I'm John Barrows. I live at 192 Cacken Drive. 
Right at the end of Midlands, so I'm probably the most affected person, so it's a little bit of a, one of those backyard issues, you know. That mm -hmm. And he's also on the Homo Association yeah. Board. And, uh, yeah, I'm one of the direct, uh, members of the Board of Directors, and his, we have a, almost a little village there. We have, I, I would say, between six and 700 people living in Dorset Farms, and, and I think they all vote, if that's what I heard. Uh, so I'm, I'm here to emphasize what Mitch was saying, that um, I'd like to see the city get involved. I spoke with Paul Connor in December and January, and quite frankly, he didn't seem to be very interested in pursuing the subject. I, and I expressed my concern of, like, when's there going to be a meeting, and when are we going to get this moving, and there's not just a little construction going on there. There's a lot of construction. They're going gung-ho, and I spoke with the manager of uh, South Village, and they said the road will be finished in the spring, and we can drive through it. And there's been a lot of, obviously, a lot of traffic going through there in the last three, four months already. And this, at that intersection, there's currently no stop signs or anything, so that's something that probably needs to be done mm -hmm. uh, sooner, sooner than later. Uh, so I'm here to ask for some coordination with the city and Great. our association. And uh, if you want to give uh, Mitch or I a call, we, we formed a new uh, committee, traffic calming committee. <laughs> and uh, we put that out to our members of Dorset uh, Farms, and we've already got seven members. Well, there's a lot of interest, and a lot of the concern already is uh, about kids crossing the road and people speeding down the road. and. Mm -hmm. You've heard all that story before, but uh, yeah. but Midland is a wide, very extremely wide road, and people do drive past on Midland. Okay. And Dorset Farms has lots of kids, uh, enough more than one school bus load of kids. Actually, there's actually two in the community. So, yes. Okay. Question: When you said the traffic islands, those are the little islands that go between lanes going one way and lanes going the other, where the streets meet, or just the whole way? What are you? I'm, I'm yeah, not, they're I'm actually uh, median islands. Uh, that that's actually what it is. It's between what you have is um, they will they. Um, it, it's a bit of curb and grass that happens to be between travel lanes. So, the only so it'll be put in the middle of the road, like at the beginning of Pheasant Way. Well, that's why I why I asked because right. there's, there's, a little something there's one at the beginning of Pheasant Way. I don't know how many times it's been repaired. I've watched the delivery trucks go over it a zillion times. <laughs> it gets run over. There's no flowers in it. It's all weeds. And the curb's been, uh, it's been chipped, cracked, broken. All I'm saying is if they're going to be traffic islands, they have to, they're not going to work if they're the typical ones. You try and plant grass in the middle. The turn radiuses are too small for delivery trucks and things like that, or the garbage trucks. And all you have is something that looks awful. It may serve a purpose, but it'll look awful. So if we're going to do that, we got to make sure that there are traffic islands that are actually going to function and be able to made to look respectable is all I'm suggesting. What they should be is um, they should, um, and we already have as-built plans. We, we don't want to design yeah, this in the I, I, but I have to keep going. going so. right. That's so all right. I'm just mentioning. You know. abso it absolutely can be. Good. Well, we can put you on the traffic That's coming you committee. So, so, <laughs> so just a, one Thank question. You. Who would oh. be the point of contact? Who should I call for questions? I I think you could contact Paul. Connor? Is that okay, Paul, or should he go through Kevin? Would no, you prefer that's that? perfectly fine, and we'll um, both communicate with uh, John and Mitch and uh, report back to council at your next meeting. So if Paul okay. doesn't call me back for a week or two, can I call somebody else? I think he'll he's call you back. He's just committed. I've got, I've got an inside He's just moment. committed. Okay. Let's yeah. not. He is. Yeah, just wanted to make sure. Thank you. He means yeah. spirit. <laughs> Thank you. Linus here. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Linus Levins, longtime resident of South Burlington. Um, I'll keep this brief. Uh, over a year ago, I came to a meeting where the Burlington Airport and Payne Jones were here giving a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, at every process offered, uh, they required an avigation easement be granted to the airport. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you accepted sound insulation or they helped you sell your house or whether the house was purchased outright. Um, they were unable to offer their actual avigation easement wording. Um, there are three versions on the BTV website right now as well as two versions that were proffered at a meeting I think in November or December. Uh, they've sold 250 houses. I would assume 
that people have signed navigation easements with them and that they do have some wording. I can't imagine that they would use FAA money uh, given the wording of the FAA template that's readily available. If you Google FAA navigation easement online, uh, the wording states that the uh, exchange is in perpetuity and that once you accept funds, you are unable to uh, ask for additional funds for loss of value, property value, a loss of use, uh, or any other reason, uh, as long as the airport is there, and that could be a thousand years or longer in perpetuity. Uh, so a caveat emptor, um, municipalities, municipal owned property like schools and city buildings are, are covered in the same legal uh, franchise that residential property is. Uh, that is, if our schools accept sound insulation money from the FAA, and my concern is that David Young is uh, going on the record as saying he's talking with the airport mm -hmm. and the FAA about Chamberlain School, about uh, accepting FAA money uh, for sound mitigation, um, that we could be in a position where we accept $60,000 for sound insulation and we could be out a $10 million school. And that would be a rather huge mistake for the city to make. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just wanted to present a short caveat emptor about the reality of the FAA, their money, their contracts, and what an navigation easement really reflects. Have you shared this with the school board? Yeah. I'll be there Wednesday, too. Oh, okay. That's okay. good. Okay. Um, I mean, we certainly are going through or continue to go through. It, it's been a year. The process year. for trying to find that language. And I, I agree with you. The navigation easement issue is very frustrating. It, it's highly improbable that the city, uh, that the uh, airport would have uh, purchased 250 houses and not had people sign contracts. I find that, you know, I'm incredulous about that. There, there have to be contracts that people signed. So you're saying, but m many of those have already been torn down. Right. I don't know if an easement comes with that. So I don't know if an easement comes with that. Oh, yeah. You think so? Yeah. Well, I'll follow up with that. It, well, the, 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 the Payne Jones presentation PowerPoint a year ago at every step, including when the airport purchases your house and navigation easement is granted to the airport at every step in that PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. I, I, well, but I guess it's kind of moot if the house is they can, torn they down. They can buy the navigation <laughs> easement outright with cash, or you have to accept one if you accept sound insulation, windows insulation, or if they help you sell your house, or if they buy your house outright. Yes, that was I, all in the Payne Jones presentation. Well, subsequent meetings, though, I do, I mean, we shouldn't get into a discussion, but. Just, uh, just wanted to give the city yes, a I, caveat I, I emptor and a warning to all the residents you of the city us of that. about this. And it I find it's been a year, and I find it slope. highly improbable that there isn't a navigation easement that exists out there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Linus. Are there any other comments or questions from the public? All righty. So we'll move right along to announcements in the city manager's <coughs> report. Do we have any announcements, Tom? I'll be really quick because we're running late. Um, I went to the City Center Performing Arts and Saturday Night event. That was fabulous. Pat LaDuke does a great job. I did, went to the SB Legislators meeting, and a resident who's actually here tonight raised a concern that's come up before, which is uh, we don't have currently enforcement of energy efficiency building codes. And uh, I just raised that. Uh, the, so the legislators sort of looked at me being a city councilor, and if we were looking at a municipal level of possibly exploring that, I raised the notion that it's come up a couple of times um, in the context of a rental registry and that might be a funding source to uh, to pay for additional individuals that might be able to go out and inspect new housing to see if it's meeting the energy stretch code that's part of our building code I didn't commit to anything but I just said that I just wanted to relate to this council that there was interest uh, at that body uh, since the state isn't really looking at enforcement of those rules but looking at a municipal level for those things happy to talk more about it yeah every every new single-family residence that's sold that has to meet the stretch code has to submit an RBS form as part of their deed do we and go out and visit the site and no, inspect it? Uh, no, yeah. I don't think so. So, I mean, I see your point, but they have to furnish this document that details the measurements that they made. If they do a blower door test, and which is required now, two blower door tests, right, Paul? Uh, I know about the certificate. I'm not sure about the tests required, but it is the legal responsibility um, 
is on the builder yeah. right. to have certified that they've yeah. that it's met that standard. That's the same with underground. But you're oil correct tanks. that there's not an inspection associated with it. We, so it might be a good. Um, I'm not saying we need a rental registry, but I think yeah. that's how Burlington funds some of that because that's a standard set of pool of money that comes in to pay for those bill wards to go out to sites and look at things. Another conversation. I went to the school master visioning set, uh, presentation. There were eight options. I just want to say for the record that I was not convinced with the three options with temporary trailer classrooms. They just was not. It was not economically attractive, nor could I see any any parent getting behind it. So they should really just cut that down to five options. I'll just say that. And then the last thing I want to say this Thursday, 5 p.m. I'm hoping the other paper puts it so that people read it before 5 p.m. on Thursday. That uh, at the police station there is a big GMT public hearing on the service changes that we're making. Great time to be heard. You can also send your comments about the bus changes to feedback at ridegmt.com but if you want to hear and talk to people that know what's happening with the bus service this Thursday 5 p.m. at the police station and there should be a great article about these changes as well in the paper this week great thank you Megan yeah I went to the school board's master planning and visioning meeting as well I didn't see you there maybe we crossed did you see me there I saw you there for the last 15 minutes I left at 7:45. okay okay yeah I stayed until the nine o'clock um, and I, um, I think it's a, an interesting discussion. I was um, expecting to see more members of the public there, um, and so I, I do encourage the public to really participate um, in, in this process. Um, and I thought, too, that there were pros and cons to the different drawings, but I'd, I'd really like to hear from the members of the public. And I'm perfectly willing to discuss my, my feedback, which I shared that night at the, at the end. I also went to the airport's um, uh, master planning mm -hmm. um, on Wednesday, or is that? I think I'm, it was Wednesday. Is that Wednesday? Yeah. yeah. Th th no, there was one, there was a meeting it was Wednesday, Wednesday, and it was <laughs> one it Thursday. Was oh, yeah, Wednesday. I think one was the yeah. Tech, yeah. tech group. Yeah, and I thought that was very well done. I, I thought the consultants did a great job explaining the needs of the airport with regard to the FAA's new regulations um, with regard to um, various things. Um, I also went with Helen to Montpelier on Friday to discuss current bills that uh, concern um, the airport um, with regard to a study for governance as well as a um, another bill that is asking for charter changes for South Burlington and Winooski to have more input on noise mitigation plans that the airport um, applies for. Um, we also um, heard good news about the um, charter change that the voters passed this past March. Um, that is moving on to the Ways and Means Committee. Um, so that is good news. Um, we also discussed um, what uh, I think we'll be discussing uh, more under other business with Martin Lalonde, who's a legislator but also a member of the school board, um, on a personal and individual counselor note, I wanted to remedy a situation that um, was brought to my attention. And Counselor Chittenden might discuss this further, and that is fine. Um, after our meeting in Montpelier, I felt moved to uh, respond to a letter that we had received um, from the chair of the school board. Um, she forwarded a letter written by another school board member and I found that there were um, there wasn't enough follow-up. I had been requesting a steering committee meeting that we will again discuss under other business since January, since we had a steering committee meeting in January, um, and where school board members um, expressed a level of dissatisfaction with the um, uh, just the, the plans and um, the, the relationship that they have with this board. And I asked that they meet with us more regularly so that we could work out the differences um, as well as the areas of distrust. Um, and we did not hear back from them until we got this letter. Um, and we also got a follow-up letter on Sunday um, after already hearing from our city manager that they are um, disputing the plans for the community center building. And in light of that, I, I wrote a letter. And I 
completely agree that it was um, inappropriate of me to, to reply all. Um, and I take full responsibility of that, but I want it to be known that I fully intended to state this in a public meeting, and I wish to remedy it immediately. So I am going to read aloud the letter that I, I addressed to the school board and to the members of this board, as well as to the senior staff at the school and, and the city. Dear colleagues, on both the school and city boards and staff, I am writing as a sole counselor in response to the email forwarded by Elizabeth Below and on the heels of an update on the school board's decision not to allow the city to implement the engineer's recommendations. In the plural, since the second engineering firm hired by the school board confirmed the recommendation of the engineering firm hired by the school and the city. Since the forwarded email has opened up a badly needed conversation, I feel that the time has come for me and others to respond. First, I wish to express my disappointment. Disappointment over the decision taken by the school board this week, and that was last week, to disregard the engineer's concurrence on the stormwater mitigation plan as the best option that would align the school's parcel with a new state mandate and solve what has been a long-standing and critical environmental issue in that area. The wetlands surrounding the school and Market Street have been caused by the impervious surfaces on school property and the commercial properties on Williston Road, among others, for decades, and the level of pollution in our lake has reached a crisis point. We are responsible to act in order to remedy the current unacceptable levels of pollution in the lake due to our stormwater. Disappointment that there has not been better communication between the two boards and that when our chair suggests in an email to a school board member steps that we might take in order to correct miscommunication, we receive the letter below in reply. The letter does not solve the issue, only compounds it, especially because it is full of misconceptions, inaccuracies, and misplaced priorities. Now is not the time to go through our laundry lists of grievances, although we could all probably produce one. I am saddened by it, frankly, because it is stark proof of the poor level of communication and understanding between the leaders of this great city, which deserves only the best, well-informed, and forward-looking leadership with vision. Second, I wish to clarify some of the misconceptions and inaccuracies. I will not get at them all, but hopefully some of them. The library move. We did not move the library out of a self-centered interest without regard for the impact on the schools. We moved the library based on the recommendation of our city manager who had met with library staff after four days of lockdowns in which not only students and teachers were locked in small dark rooms with buckets, but also librarians, moms with young children, and elderly folks who happened to be in the public library at the time. Our manager explained to us the anguish and distress that these folks had been under and his determination not to let his staff nor the public users of a library be subjected to this kind of lockdown experience. Necessary for school safety, we understand, but inappropriate for a public library. This is the reason we decided to move the library when the opportunity presented itself. Did you hear us publicly make a plea to keep our staff and library users out of the school for this reason? No. Why? Because, and I'm speaking personally, it would have scared our traumatized public and stigmatized our school system even more. We chose to show restraint when making the case to the public by focusing on the positive angle that Jennifer Murray was focused on. The move, as difficult as it was, could make the later transition to a new freestanding building easier. The arena. We did not bring the idea of an arena into public discussion out of the blue, and certainly not with a clear consensus on the City Council, nor the expectation that the schools were secondary to our city center interests. The idea was raised only within the context of the school master planning and visioning, when the configuration of our three elementary schools was actively being discussed by an at least 12-member board for 18 months. The school board had received a ludicrous offer of $7 million for the Rick Marcotte Central School property, and discussions had ensued about consolidation, the use of Oak Creek, the closing of Chamberlain, etc. 
Because the elementary school properties were being discussed and because visioning included ideas of possible land swaps, etc., the city contributed to the cost of the school's consultants and we imagined what might be possible. We also had UVM's goals for a new arena and the uncertain future of the U Mall property in the mix as we were considering what might be possible in addition to Market Street and Garden Street, which had already undergone a visioning process in our city center plans. Discussion of the arena got no further than a what if, and I would have perhaps entertained the idea of it being located at U Mall if UVM and the public were behind it. It never got to the public. Yes, there was a video put together by architects that showed the arena in the location of or near Marcotte, but this video had not been endorsed by the city council. Indeed, I was very much opposed to the closure of the school and spoke up about it at meetings. Tim Barrett first ran on the position of his opposition and was elected to the council. Helen was opposed, and I'll let Tom speak for himself, although I gathered he shared this opinion. Dave was not yet on the council. We had never seriously discussed it. It was all part of the ancillary discussion of the school's master planning and visioning, and we never voted on it, let alone reached a consensus. I can say without a doubt that we were all prepared to defer to the school board. And I cannot think of one occasion when a counselor pu publicly claimed that our schools are too expensive. Please fill us in, because I only recall spending evenings at school board meetings at the middle school and writing letters to the local papers in defense of the schools and in support of the school budget and of the value of the education our children are receiving. Ideas, and especially within a visioning exercise, should not be taboo. Indeed, the use of the Underwood property for a new high school came up during the Charette's exercise at the middle school cafeteria. That was the first I had heard of it as an idea and did not take offense as a sitting city councilor. This is what visioning is about. If the public had leapt at this idea, the council, in my view, should have taken it under serious consideration. As a board, we do not have dominion over these land parcels. We are only stewards of what belongs to the public. Same for dollars. When the expansion of schools out after school and summer programs drained our youth recreation programs of users, the council did not accuse the school of quote unquote dipping into our resources and at least a $35,000 drop in city revenues of being quote unquote manipulative or of dismissing the importance of the public recreation programming. The staff did not write accusatory scolding columns in the other paper as one of our most respected school administ administrators did following the council's decision to move the library. We saw that the public's needs were being tended to and collectively moved on with an eye for adapting to the new situation by developing new programming. In hindsight, more discussion on these and other topics were, was clearly necessary. I am willing to accept that people jumped to assumptions based on the limited information they had. However, the problem is as I see it, and which I see as necessary to see as a problem that needs to be fixed, is that people did not have enough information in order to jump to a good and well-informed assumption. We as board members have traditionally relied on our staff and on our chairs to keep the information flow regular and accurate. This may not, it seems, be enough and especially not at a time when the asks we are asking are high as we move the community forward. I attended the visioning meeting at the middle school last Tuesday and saw the dollar signs attached to the eight plans and very few members of the public. You need us and we need you, but not as a way to get votes from reluctant members of the voting public. Rather, we can help one another expand and inform the public discussion as ideas are vetted I welcomed David Young's appearance before the council in order to inform the council about the Black Lives Matter flag being flown at the high school. We need to know these things and understand the reasons in order to be able to speak informedly of them with the public. We're a team and need to act like a team, informing one another as we vet ideas publicly and working for the benefit and for the future prosperity of the city. Counselors want the schools to thrive. I would think that the schools want more affordable housing and more economic growth in the city and perhaps other benefits that we bring to the school on the city side, like plowing and roads and stormwater. 
We all benefit from the success of each board's projects in pursuit of a combined mission to make the city the best it can be. This letter is longer than I had initially intended, and although I have probably missed some of the points in Bridget's letter, I will save them for a meeting when we can all talk about them together, and if needed, hash them out. Our residents are counting on us, and it is imperative that we do so. Thank you for your hard work and service to this wonderful city. Sincerely yours, Megan. Thank I have, I did have two other reply alls. Shall I read those for the public? I'm happy to do so. Um, this was in response to Elizabeth's dis discussion um, of the reasons why the school board was denying us use of 0.4 acres for stormwater improvements on the school property. And I, I'm happy to, to read those also to the public. Um, so in response to her letter, I wrote, Dear Chairs Fitzgerald and Reilly, I respectfully request that we hold a joint public hearing in order to understand the public's <coughs> view on this conundrum. I do not believe that the public has been adequately informed or consulted in light of the new state mandate and its impacts on the publicly sanctioned policy vote of November 2018. Thank you for your consideration. Megan. And then I wrote, because I saw that the school board members were not copied and I was responding to what I had understood to be a lack of communication and I acknowledge that this is not something I should do. I wrote, FYI, now copying the school board members and Tom Hubbard. I am writing to ensure smooth communication by forwarding my response to our acting city manager, Tom Hubbard, since Kevin is away this week, and the other school board members. To remind everyone, our city clerk was quoted in the local paper stating that the November 6, 2018 voter turnout was, and I quote, at the level of a presidential election. It was 64.3% in record-breaking for a midterm election. City Article 1 for the City Center Building Project passed 6,379 votes to 2,500. It passed 72%. City Article 2 on the terms of the lease purchase of 575 Dorset to the school district passed 6,940 votes to 1,899 votes. It passed by 78.5%. School Article 1 on the conveyance of three easements at Rick Marcotte to use for parking, utilities, and access passed 6,697 votes to 2,045 votes, or 76.6%. School Article 2 regarding the option to lease or buy 575 Dorset passed 6,852 votes to 1,886 votes, or by 78.4%. It's important to keep in the forefront of our minds the voters' wishes. They must be informed and consulted with regard to the new state mandate and the resulting impact on school property and community center building plans, and with regard to the impact of the school board's decision. An email to counselors does not suffice. Sincerely yours, Megan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. David. Well, I'm not going to read anything as lengthy as Megan. <laughs> No, I was, I was uh, away for a week, and all I've done last week is catch up, so I have okay. nothing else. I, I, I did meet with Kevin last, uh, last, last Monday, last Tuesday, Wednesday, somewhere along there, just to get caught up on everything, to be sure I wasn't behind. Great. And okay. that's that. Tim? I attended the, T the TDR meeting last week, and I also attended the BIA master plan at the airport and discovered that there are a dozen Tesla charging stations in the garage of the airport now, six of which are for Teslas and six of which are for normal non-Tesla cars, right? And there's no charge for them at this time. Okay. Of course, if you pl pull in your Tesla and plug in and leave for two weeks, yeah, that parking space is know, taken up. Um, uh, I also spent two nights in Boston visiting my son who passed his PQE in his PhD program, which is really great. It's two out of the five years through. Um, but as part of that, we went for a hike in the Blue Hills Reservation outside uh, about south, uh, south, southwest of Boston, maybe about 10 miles out. It's near where uh, 95 hits 128. And, you know, when you talk about appreciation, appreciating open space in South Burlington, right, and, and you talk about a very densely populated place like Boston and you go visit the Blue Hills Reservation, you understand what 
a real jewel it is to have a place that has no development in it whatsoever. It just has trees and paths and rocks and mountain and uh, an observation deck on top, which is... And the last thing I'll say is that there's this monument that's at the top next to the meteorolo meteorological you know, weather station that has printed on it the highs and lows since 1885 in Boston up till 1984. And it has August 2nd, 1975 as 101 degrees, which was the second hottest read, the, the second day of the hottest reading in, over that time period. And I clearly remember that it was a Friday and I was working in a kitchen uh, in the summertime. Ooh. And it's known in New England meteorological history as Hot Friday. So <laughs> no, just so you know, a little piece of trivia. That's what I did, <laughs> thanks. Um, I went to the South Burlington Business Association meeting and sat at the tax table which was kind of interesting. I liked the way they set it up, <clears throat> and I thought it was very effective. Um, Tom was there with me and, um, at that table. And as um, Megan mentioned, we went to the legislature together, and we have plans to continue that work um, um, advocating. We met with Mary Sullivan, Representative Mary Sullivan from Burlington today. So we're trying to move along the two airport um, bills and get some um, traction on those. Um, and then uh, just to pick up on Tim's um, concept, I was in Florida visiting my sister and had the pleasure of going on one of those really fast little boats on the Everglades. There were just four of us and we went way out. And we got sort of to the middle and the guy stopped the engine so we could talk. And you could look 360 degrees and see nothing. It's a million acres, which is huge. And it was fabulous. I could have spent hours there. Um, and, you know, I just would pick up on, on or underscore that having open space available to people is, um, you know, so good for the soul and so good for your health and your mind. And, and this is Florida, where everything is so overdeveloped. You get off the, out of the um, Everglades, and it's, ugh. But how lucky they are to have one place where you can go, and it's really just wildlife, and there's, there's nothing there except the sawgrass and alligators and fantastic birds and flowers. It was really pretty amazing. So I'm glad that we have um, both an open um, space fund and that we really dedicate money and our efforts to maintaining some of that for our, um, our residents. Okay. okay. I'll, Any reports? For yeah, I'll just say I'm, I'm glad to be back. I'm recovering from an illness and some minor surgery, and it's good to be back doing what I like to do. <laughs> Uh, be able to wear my glasses again. I can actually see. And, um, so anyway, and just a reminder that Kevin's uh, away for the week, but uh, I think you all yep. got the memos on that. So he'll be back yep. on Monday. And those were good memos. That was yeah. helpful. Okay, any uh, item seven, um, any city council committee assignment reports? I commented on the airport uh, commission meeting, and I did mention those, um, uh, those plug-in um, at the airport and had raised the same concern. So does it just take like 10 minutes and then you park somewhere else? But no, you you got the spot and you're, I guess, revving up the whole time. So are there any? Yes. <laughs> Open Space IZ Committee, we met uh, two weeks ago, Wednesday, and we were looking at the matrix that um, a subcommittee prepared in order to evaluate uh, different parcels for conservation. And I will be um, following up on that along with everyone else tomorrow night. Um, we went through kind of a, a practice exercise looking at one of the parcels together so that we could see how we would test our, our, yeah, our, our numbering system, and we're all going to be reporting back tomorrow night on different parcels. Oh, nice. So we're moving quite along. Yeah. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Um, the consent agenda. I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda with how many? Two, four, six items. So of moved. Second. I make uh, just one comment on item D. 
that uh, while you can go ahead and give a head nod to your thought process on that, it actually has to be done as an official motion on the 15th, which is the warning for the public, uh, oh. or the continuance of that uh, public hearing. On so, the 15th? Right. Oh, okay. So All you right. can continue it again at that meeting, but I just did, I wanted to clarify that that will still be on the agenda for the 15th. I actually did find one, and I, I apologize for not sending it to you, Tim. I guess on March 7th, which was the the um, town <coughs> meeting, was that, or was that the 4th? The uh, 4th, yeah. So that would be the 4th, okay. Right. Um, one of the paragraphs identified Martin Lalonde as talking about the smoking um, Oh. Oh, Alex and, it, uh, and it was actually Alex McHenry. Oh. Okay, Good I'm catch. sorry I didn't. If you'll make that correction, please. And I meant to send it to you, and I forgot. I apologize. So we have. A, do we have a motion to approve these? Yes. Uh, and a second. And a second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, those pass. Um, so item nine is the council review and discussion of the crime and arrest statistics. And Chief Sean Burke, I'm sorry we've kept you waiting so long, but. Happy to be here. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. I'm good. I'm good. Thanks, I can sir. share. I'm the Girl Scout. And so the public might um, better understand why we've um, asked uh, Chief Burke to come. He's started um, sharing with the council on, a, I think it's weekly or bi weekly? Weekly. A weekly um, reports on. Um, arrests and criminal activity in the community to give us a sense of what's happening. And um, while it's kind of interesting to read, and I personally have noted some repetitive homes or unfortunately incidences with some people, um, we thought it would make sense to have a better understanding of you know what you're really trying to convey and share with us those findings. So we, he was invited to make this presentation. So I thank you. Well, thanks for having me. So uh, I wasn't a thousand percent clear on what Kevin wanted me to, to cover. So okay. what I handed out here is actually um, a merger of two projects. The, the PowerPoint slides were redacted out of the uh, presentation that I gave at our department meeting in January, which uh, focused a lot on, on, da on different data points. And then uh, the, the pages that are attached to this, you know, this week's uh, report to go out to uh, the media on arrest and our general call log. And so that, unless there's an objection, I just wanted to go through the first couple of pages here to sure. speak more about crime trends or police data trends. So on your page two um, is a synopsis of the data that we analyzed beginning November 1st, 2016 through uh, a similar date in 2018. I chose two years simply because I wanted a, a large enough sample size. So if there was anything of significance that we could, we could say so in the context of policing South Burlington. And, and in that time we had uh, just shy of 29,000 incidents. Uh, incidents uh, have been fairly static uh, at about 14,000 a year, so there's really nothing uh, uh, shocking there. Uh, as a result of those total incidents, we made uh, 1,360 criminal arrests, and we'll get into uh, kind of the granular detail on those arrests in, in a subsequent slide. Uh, time of day and day of week prevalence was also examined and uh, not shocking given the service nature of the community that uh, a majority of our activity is Monday through Friday between the hours of uh, 8 in the morning and, and 6 in the evening. And uh, of kind of uh, an interesting side note, uh, we've also looked at, you know, hot spots, if you will, in, in policing. And I will say that the University Mall property represents about 5% of these total, uh, total responses. So I, I did find that somewhat, uh, somewhat interesting. 
Um, the, the arrest by time of day, we did a breakdown there. There was really nothing uh, shocking or insightful in, in that data. On page three in your packet, uh, it kind of breaks down our top calls for service. So uh, it was uh, reaffirming, I guess, or, or affirming to hear the traffic concerns uh, here earlier, earlier this evening because the top incident category for the city police is uh, traffic stops. 6,373 total stops in that in that two-year window. And that includes an uh, accident, right? No. Oh, no, those aren't accidents. No. That's just speeding or going through a stoplight and that kind of stuff? That's correct. <clears throat> so uh, accident data, it, I believe it's on here, on uh, property oh, damage. That's right. well, yeah, there are about 1,000 a year, and that's been uh, fairly consistent uh, as reflected in this data set. The next highest or the second um, most frequent call for service is agency assist. That can be anything from serving a subpoena for uh, the district court to assisting the fire department uh, somewhere. It's a really, or, or checking on a family that's vulnerable or working with department, uh, department ch children and family services. So it's kind of a, a really wide array, but it does drive a lot of our uh, call volume. Third is uh, alarm response. Fourth, suspicious events. This could be anything from, you know, the wind blows and uh, a trash can knocks over. Someone hears that, we're happy to respond out and check that out. Um, another example, a popular or a common example of suspicious event, uh, someone in the IDX parking lot uh, late at night, the officers check on that. It's documented as a suspicious event. Uh, just kind of examples of what goes into that work. Public assist. This could be uh, anything from uh, someone that's been served a court order and we're going over to retrieve property with them, pursuant to a family court order, things of that nature, and then accidents. Uh, what I'm trying to highlight here, though, is that there's not a lot of crime in city policing, and that's universal. There's a lot of service work. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, again, with the University Mall property, I, I found it interesting that uh, over, over this time period that our number is creeping up from about 5% to just over 6% of our total call volume. Again, the end's not huge. We're talking about 729 incidents in 17 and then uh, just slightly over 900 incidents in 2018. Um, what is kind of notable, we have a trade through retirement, uh, a number of staff. A lot of this work is being done with about 18 officers in patrol, supervised by uh, six sergeants and one lieutenant. Is the 9-11 the hang up um, those numbers? I was kind of surprised to see it on here, but I, I, is that typical that people call up and then hang up? It's super I mean, typical like a lot when you have a large commercial uh, density population and to dial out on a trunk line it's nine so anytime that someone picks up a line and they go to make a call out out of uh, service area they dial nine one and then whatever the uh, area code is so each time someone mistakenly hits nine one one it goes to uh, one of the public safety oh, dispatch okay. centers, oh, good. which triggers like, a response. I was thinking man are people just trying to joke it or <laughs> who picked that nine the first nine is a the button to push. Oh, uh, <laughs> IBM has been like that since 1970. Oh, okay. Well, that clarifies it. Thank you. <laughs> Tom? I have, I have opined on this council uh, that I would be supportive of raising the rooms and meals tax <laughs> to the, be uh, the same as Burlington because that would be taxing those that eat in our in our city as well as stay in our city. <laughs> and the people that are eating and sitting, staying in our city aren't necessarily paying property taxes, so I would want them to pay their fair share for policing. Do you think the data that you're presenting here bears that out, that our, our meal, the places that provide meals as well as our rooms or hotels use a disproportionate amount of our policing services, thus justifying uh, to bring the rooms and meals tax in parity with Burlington to 12% or whatever it is? I would really need to drill down on that um, because, you know, when I think about the, uh, the radio runs that we're doing at the U-Mall, they're generally not centered around uh, the food, uh, food service in industry nor alcohol. Uh, and in fact, I would, I would say that our increased level of activity there now is the new stores that have uh, professional loss prevention and they're actually reporting the, uh, the incidents of retail theft, the incidents of trespass that are leading the retail theft. Um, so, but I, you know, it would be an interesting set to look at, you know, hotels, restaurants, um, 
bars. I, I will tell you anecdotally that we don't have the alcohol-based incidents that uh, our neighboring community does, uh, having lived in both. It's just different when you have a, an active, vibrant nightlife that everyone exits at, at 2 in the morning. And there's just uh, unique challenges that go into that, and, and luckily we don't have that here. Yeah. We go to bed early here. Yeah. <laughs> Lights out. If you ever drive around at 2 a.m., it's pretty dark. I support you know development in any any way that it needs to go, but uh, I will tell you that it's not bad. Uh, <laughs> not right. having that 2 a.m. Good night's uh, sleep is wake good. Up. <clears throat> okay, so you're page four. Uh, this isn't a great visual, but it was in the presentation. But it, what this illustrates is uh, our top arrest counts. And, and no shocker here, retail theft is the number one uh, arrest count, uh, followed by driving with a, a suspended license and then uh, DUI. And what's, why I bring that up is when you look at a PD, our police department that's doing you know, 6,000 traffic stops, obviously they're detecting people that are under the influence and, and uh, driving on suspended licenses. And then uh, the fourth count down being violation of condition of release, followed by unlawful trespass. A lot of times those uh, particular cases are directly tied into the top count of retail theft, where someone is continually stealing or going back to a place where they've uh, stolen from, and then they're subsequently charged with uh, a viola violation of the condition of release or being um, on a premise that they're prohibited from being. So nothing uh, shocking there. And, and if you look at uh, policing in our neighboring community, the top counts are very, very similar. Uh, the only difference really being is Burlington's top arrest count is historically disorderly conduct. Can I ask a question? Yes. What, what is the green 72 percent? That's is everything that? else. Everything else. Everything, everything else. else. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. and again. Um, but smaller than 4 percent each, the, yes. the categories? Yes. Um, you know, uh, and on that note, what I'm most proud of right now is uh, our officers are making really, really good domestic violence cases. And that's an area that I want to focus on, not because that I see it as a huge percentile of the crime that we're responding that we're responding to, but I do see it as a crime that's very, very serious, that has uh, lethality implications. And when we're called uh, to these these uh, incidents, our cops now, through training and better policy, are understanding that. It's not about the call that you're at. It's about all the family dynamics that have led up to that call and to look at that this is an opportunity to, to kind of do an autopsy of what's been going on. And uh, the officers have been doing uh, a really great job of unearthing some historical domestic violence cases, some stalking cases, and some uh, like violation of abuse prevention order in order to kind of shift that power dynamic and, and to get the victim empowered in a better place. So that's something that- That's great. Yeah, I don't- has the mental health outreach helped with that? So, uh, you know, they, they help uh, immensely, but we'd have to look at the calls for service that are, you know, mental health related, or a lot of those fall into suspicious, some of them fall into trespassing, uh -huh. but generally those complaints, those incidents aren't, li aren't rising to the level of arrest, uh -huh. and that's oh, the I goal. See. Yeah. Um, and these are arrests, right, right. naturally. Ultimately, we want to get <laughs> right. uh, the community exactly. outreach intervention much earlier so there isn't a referral to uh, criminal court because that's just not the place where those individuals tend to need to be. A year ago we were discussing um, having um, you know some kind of event um, we hadn't yet exactly determined what kind I had come forward with a proposal to have an informational event similar to what was held uh, before you were on board um, but with regard to uh, the opioid crisis and we had um, both state and local officials present to to really fill in the members of the public on um, the different dangers of these drugs that were out there um, the risk that our own EMT and and um, emergency personnel were putting were being exposed to um, and I thought that it might be useful to the community um, to have some kind of educational event um, with regard to domestic violence. This was, of course, following the very sad incident that occurred in our community in last a year ago, May, I believe. Um, and uh, we haven't 
followed up on that. I think there was some discussion whether it should be more of a restorative um, process um, that we have, uh, you know, we have the very capable, um, uh, Bed Mrs. what's her first name, Bedinger. Um, Lisa. Lisa. Lisa, thank you. Lisa Bedinger uh, would direct some kind of discussion to help us heal through that. So that was a different, uh, yeah. different conception. I'm, I'm just reaching out here since you're discussing um, this kind of case. Should we be again revisiting this at the at the moment uh, that when we were t talking about it, the the thought was maybe let things kind of settle and then we could come back and and revisit it again. Do you see that as something that would be useful? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, an excellent opportunity to, to talk about it because out of all the things that that the police can do really really well. There's no way that we can actually, through um, a simple campaign, address domestic violence. Um, it's something that, you know, it, it's almost frustrating to the police. By the time we get involved, that it's, it seems a little too late. Um, so I, I believe that maybe in concert with Domestic Violence Awareness Month, with uh, some resourcing from uh, the CJC team and Lisa, that that could have a lot of meaning for the community. So uh, I can I can make a note of that and follow up with Lisa and see if we can maybe uh, examine what other communities have done or haven't done and see what might fit for, for South Burlington. I think it would be good for the public to, to know the, um, I guess, improved or focus, uh, different focus that the police are taking around domestic violence because yes. that clearly, sh well not clearly, but it seems to me that um, approaching it the way you described would um, prevent some. So you have less incidences of, you know, maybe a murder or something um, and, and really you're get, trying to get at the, the core and then you have the outreach team that can follow up um, effectively with families and in, in a less volatile situation. Yeah, no, absolutely. So it'd be good to know. I mean, Don't I think steal my thunder for my impressed. annual report, though. Oh, okay. Well, that, <laughs> well, no, <laughs> no but, but I mean, I think those things, um, it's good for the public to understand what our new police chief is doing and what the force is doing more effectively. I think that's different, though, from what Lisa was proposing. She was oh. proposing those healing circles. Right. So maybe both. But I thought both. you were proposing more educational, educational outreach. Educational outreach yes. is what. Yeah. So maybe both would be appropriate. I think so. Think I so? saw it as two different. You okay, good. Yes. Yeah. I, I just want to echo what Councilor Emery saying. I was involved in some of these conversations <laughs> last year as well after the tragedy. And I, I just think uh, having an open panel event where you have experts that can talk about domestic violence, things to watch for, things that you can do, and also as a support uh, event for those that might be in those circumstances, because it's happening in our community. So we, we need to, I think, draw a, a flashlight or highlight it with a big spotlight. And I'd love that that's a focus for you. So a, a panel discussion would be very meaningful. Well, that could be a very, an excellent collaboration with the education department or the school board right. when the is the month of domestic violence awareness October yes thank you I'm glad you reminded us uh, and then so now I'm to page five in your packet which is the uh, weekly arrest report so really what the arrest report in the ensuing media report uh, serve as is uh, you know it's an effort in, in transparency and police operations, but it's also something that police departments do on a regular basis in order to uh, provide the media with uh, a record of what we have been uh, doing in the community, who's been arrested in the community. And, uh, and a lot of times we do independent media release releases on high profile incidents or arrests of note, but that's not to say that, uh, you know, an, uh, enterprising reporter isn't working on some type of crime trend story, or perhaps um, you know a neighborhood has a concern that they've talked to the media about. And this is a way of just front, front loading that process. And then uh, we've actually changed the interface on our records portion of the police department website. Whereas if a member of the media or the public has uh, an inquiry about a certain uh, incident, they can just go ahead and fill out an online uh, submission form and uh, pursuant to the Public Records Act, we'll turn that around in, in three days and get it back, sometimes with some redactions, other times without. 
Um, so again, this was just trying to get uh, ahead of uh, inquiries and to front load the media with what the South Burlington Police has been uh, up to. And uh, you know, I'm quite proud uh, as the chief that the work that the police department is doing. And I think this highlights, you know, the arrests can be a little misleading. And uh, if I can just draw your attention to page five in the, in the packet. Um, first of all, you'll note that there is a, uh, a, a column in the center that's completely redacted. So uh, the, the Sunday morning dispatcher actually physically has to do this. We generate this report, they go in and redact the date of birth and age of the arrestee. Um, and it's really, really important when there's a juvenile arrested so we don't compromise the identity of a juvenile. And I don't have the specific example in this week's report, but when a juvenile is actually arrested, instead of the name, it just, it just prints juvenile in all caps. Um, but it was super critical that we got the date of birth and the age out because given the numeric address, it would be really, really easy to identify an arrested right. juvenile. Um, another thing to note on this particular report is that you'll see, and I'll use uh, the, the name that's uh, two-thirds of the way down the, the page, Daniel Culver. So that's one incident with four charges. So, um, you know, sometimes people may glance over that and say, wow, that guy was arrested four times. That's not the case. It was just that his criminality included four offenses. Uh, and then the other thing that's at the top of this page, there's that, the two, uh, grand, the two uh, graphics. That's really artifact of Valcor, our records management system, where it gives you a breakdown of which shift is uh, primarily responsible for these arrests. And then the one on the right is what area of the city uh, <coughs> the arrests were made in. Mm -hmm. What is T? Can you help me Dark find? Dark gray on the top, on, on the right, under area. Is that 7.1%? Oh, maybe. I, I found that hard to read, but. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, this is super granular, or super grainy. Okay, it that's, is, I okay. couldn't make it big that's enough good. on the screen, and then it got maybe more it is, granular. Yeah, it, it is a number, <laughs> that's right, yeah, yeah. okay. Okay. <clears throat> and then just um, about the, the media log itself, uh, by default, it actually produces without the actual numeric street address, and that is to uh, not disclose the identity of any uh, crime victims. And uh, the incidents, they kind of are what they are. I did want to just talk about uh, a couple of the ones that are really, really generic and are prevalent, one being directed patrol. So um, you'll notice that there's a lot of directed patrol on Shelburne Road and a lot of directed patrol on San Remo Drive. That's in direct response to uh, a project or a concern that we're working on, San Remo Drive. There is uh, a certain level of, of disorder that goes on uh, when there's 675 uh, folks with opioid use disorder seeking their treatment there mm -hmm. that, we res that we're working with, with the, uh, the business community over there. So every day, uh, the, one of the day shift patrol cars is assigned to go over there, spend some time looking at the ancillary parking lots to make sure that there isn't any criminal uh, behavior. But we want to document that and make sure that we're doing it every day. So that's why you'll see a directed patrol there. In a similar fashion, we've had uh, some complaints about drug activity at a certain uh, location on Shelburne Road. So in order to document that and keep track of our efforts there, those uh, directed patrols on, on Shelburne Road are directly related to uh, those efforts. And uh, there's one other thing. Uh, suspicious events, I, I kind of talked about that earlier. That's kind of a, a wide open uh, category for a lot of different uh, police responses or, or basic investigations that go on. Uh, a lot of proactivity with uh, officers looking around, particularly on the night shift in closed commercial parking lots for uh, people that are at a place, maybe casing a place for a burglary, maybe they're uh, passed out drunk behind the wheel or using drugs. Uh, but every time that an officer actually has contact with a citizen, one of these uh, incidents is generated to document that. And as you can see, week to week, there's about 290 or so published incidents, which results in the 14,000 or so annual incidents that the police department is investigating. Aside from that, I didn't I want to leave some time if you had specific questions about um, this project or in general what the police department has going on. 
It's hard for me to see trends when I read through the arrest reports that we receive. So I appreciate you, you know, giving us kind of the overview. So I'll, I'll just make that as a, I mean, it's always hard to read <laughs> yeah. these, this kind of data, but. Yeah. Well, and I noted I was specifically looking for mental health issues because I was just curious and there were, you know, a couple streets that had every couple days or were, and I'm assuming it was the same family that you really had a, you knew what was going on and potentially it was um, being directed to a source that would help them. So that made me sort of feel better rather than just going back and going back and going back and really not having any options. Yeah, I mean, the, what the community outreach team provides is really, really remarkable, and I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to try to police um, without it, given the the mental health crisis that we're faced with. Uh, and unfortunately, it does take several responses sometimes for people to be in the right spot to make their decision that now is the time uh, to access help or to you know deal with whatever whatever they're facing. Um, but I will tell you, you know, as far as resilient uh, employees, the police are there, but, but right side by side are those community outreach workers and uh, their ability to uh, follow up even when they're not on duty, you know, when our night shift officers are going to the same, uh, same addresses, but the resource isn't uh, immediately available. All our officers have to do is send the community outreach team an email, will you please follow up with this family or this person the next day, and they are right there on it. Okay, thank you very much thank for you. all that you do. Thank you. Okay, item 10, council review and discussion related to the proposed formation of a multi-community conservation district and a review of a possible accord to form the district. So Ashley, welcome. Hello. <laughs> um, I'm Ashley Parker. I am a project manager for the city. Um, I'm excited to actually uh, see you guys tonight to talk to you about the um, initiative that we've been working very hard on. Um, I'm going to provide you with an update and a quick overview of the Regional Conservation Partnership. Um, recently we've been working with the towns of Williston, Shelburne, uh, Hinesburg, St. George, and more recently Charlotte has joined the pack. So how many of that? That's one, two, three, four, five, that's six of us. So it's a nice number um, to form a regional conservation partnership. And originally this idea came up when um, folks recognized the amount of land, uh, conserved land, in the vicinity of South Burlington, Wilson, and Shelburne boundaries and um, recognized the opportunity for connectivity of conserved land, um, and um, also the idea that natural resources um, cross town boundaries and really need to be managed more at a landscape scale. Uh, so in general, regional conservation partnerships are not a new idea. Uh, you guys may be aware of the one just south of us that is the Chittenden County Uplands Regional Conservation Partnership. Um, they generally form to increase the pace and scale of land protection. Um, they also uh, involve a large network of public or partnerships, a network of people including private and public organizations and agencies, uh, and we, all working together to develop and implement um, the shared long-term conservation vision that can be just across town boundaries, state boundaries, and sometimes even international boundaries. Um, you should have received, I think Kevin included, the draft accord language that we've been working on. So. Um, as specified in that in that draft, are some of the goals that we've we've listed already include to increase the amount of connected conserved land, and I'm just going to throw in there also stewardship of that land, um, improving water quality, uh, protecting agriculture, and preventing the fragmentation of wildlife habitat and riparian corridors. Um, to date, we've met three times, starting in February. Um, and we've been really discussing that draft language for the accord document. Um, 
Currently, you'll notice in that Accord document, we are identifying ourselves as a Southwest Chittenden County Conservation Partnership, but I think that certainly could change as the group continues to work to identify the conservation priorities that it has. Um, we originally started out as a Muddy Brook Conservation Partnership, um, but as we've expanded, it, it doesn't really fit within that um, watershed. Um, we also recently started working with the um, uh, CCRPC to start putting together a map of the region, um, initially to help identify, um, conserve lands within each municipality so that we know where those are, that can help us identify um, conservation gaps or um, priority areas. Um, but it's still in very much a draft form. We just looked at it at our last meeting. And so we need to still refine that. Um, and some of that is looking at how do I better identify parcels um, in terms of conservation. So that's something that I hope to share with you very soon. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I want to just, what? I would think the IZ committee com committee would be very interested in that as well. Yeah, I think that was mentioned actually at our last, yeah. our last yeah. meeting. Yeah. So hopefully we can get that. Our next meeting is in a couple weeks, so mm -hmm. yeah. Um, we did um, just invite Natural Resource Committee and Conservation Commission representatives and as well as um, local um, land trust representatives to join our last meeting. Uh, eventually, I envision this group expanding to include other, other partners um, and other land trusts and other groups that are interested in conservation. Um, uh, but we're still trying to figure out who we are and what we are. So. Um, but yeah, so the goal right now is to, to really work and finalize the accord that we've shared with you, uh, including and incorporating any feedback um, that folks are getting from their, their councils or their select boards. Um, and then eventually, like I said, inviting the other local partners to the table to discuss this, um, pri you know, discussing our priorities, getting those nailed down, and getting this map uh, lined up is, is what we're looking at. So. Questions? Tom? Two things. I love it. I love regionalization. I love seeing towns work together. And you mentioned Blue Hills earlier. I know Blue Hills very well. My in-laws are from that area. And so I just keep thinking of that region of our metropolitan area as like the Blue Hills of the Boston area. So I, I love that it's coming together. Yeah. Any other comments or thoughts? I, I loved all your goals. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know how many more I would add um, or could think to add. What's, what are the next steps? I was assuming to see some kind of money <laughs> attached to this. Yeah, we haven't, um, we have not talked money yet, but I think down the road, yes, it may involve financial contributions or, I mean, I know for me, there's, I, I've been in the grant world where stewardship, managing land and purchasing land becomes a lot easier when you have a lot of people at the table, um, grants really like partnerships. Um, so I think that'll be really helpful for a lot of things that we would like to do, um, especially crossing the boundaries. So, do most of the membership at this point have um, open space <coughs> funds or conservation uh, funds? Whether it's a little, you know, general fund contribution or a tax like we have. It's kind of a mixed bag. I uh -huh. think we probably had the most contribution. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, the one that's just sticking out, I think, is Shelburne. Um, they have to kind of go and ask for it every every time it has to go back on the ballot. So they don't have something that's mm -hmm. that's there. But Charlotte has one, don't they? I believe so. Do they have a land bank? Do they have a I don't. Re I haven't met them yeah. yet. Just, I was just curious. That could be one of the strategies to find some funding is for some of the other partners to go back to their community and say, you know, we don't have to raise it all, but if we need to contribute. Well, that's great. So you need a motion to um, authorize you to sign. To authorize oh, me we're not to sign yet. that. It's just a oh, no? oh, okay. 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 Review and so this is review. just, we don't have to <laughs> vote on this. We just have to say just what we've you, already I, said. Yeah, I was looking for comments. Um, if you lo loved it, hated it, had anything. Well, great. We to love it. It, it looks, uh, it's excellent. <laughs> so. I, mean, like, yeah. I, I just want to keep South Brighton Wildlife in South Burlington, how do we keep it from crossing over to other towns? Because <laughs> I don't want it mixing with the Williston wildlife, because I've heard things about them, and I'm really right. concerned. I'm concerned. I don't know that I can help you with that. <laughs> Troublemaker bunnies. Yeah. Now, I, I was just curious, and it probably, 
it isn't really land conservation, but I was just curious about view corridors and that kind of aspect of open space. And was that brought up at all? It may not really lend itself to that, but some of the view corridors cross a couple towns. Sure. It has not come up in our few that are left. <laughs> but that might be, I mean, you could bring it up. I, I yeah. won't not sign it or something if it didn't have that. We have a couple questions from the audience. Roseanne? Yeah, how could individuals who are sympathetic to what you're doing get involved? Um, uh, so right now, we're just, we've gotten the municipalities together. Um, and the South Burlington Land Trust has been participating. Right. Right. And the NRC, the Natural Resources Commission, or Committee has been yeah. uh, participating. But um, I would, uh, you can always reach out to me. Um, we haven't really opened it up to anybody else yet because we just wanted to find who we are first before we kind of get too big. Don? Yeah, um, just, I just wondered. Would um, you, um, uh, I, I should have asked Roseanne to identify yourself for the um, record, please. Yeah, Donna Laban, and I was involved with the conservation easement for the Wheeler Nature Park, mm -hmm. and I just wondered what would be the possible connection, and wh what's the standing right now on the conservation easement at Wheeler? The state, uh, let's see. Um, Kevin was asked that question, and he responded, um, I remember exactly what the response was. Um, and I can't, but I can look it up. I'll, I'll, I can email you his response. I just can't remember. No, I just wondered. Cause it, yeah, but I don't know the connection. I mean, yeah, I just was exactly where that easement conversation or discussion is, I don't, I can't recall. But in terms of that conserved land within this and that easement, is there a Connection. Um, I mean, it's probably identified the, in the... The focus on this is more where boundaries intersect with each other across town lines. Uh -huh. And I, I think that's more the, the focus of your group, right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, to, we'll support each other. Yeah. You know, if there's a project that's important, um, I think the group will be supportive to help make a, like, so a project happen that may not even be in their municipality. Um, so if I don't really, I'm not super familiar with the Wheeler project, the easement project, um, but eventually it could per perhaps help it if it's funding. Maybe it could help, you know, the idea of it being there could help acquire funding. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm not familiar with the status of that, so. We'll keep our South Burlington bunnies over in Wheeler. Oh, no, the bunnies can go. Yeah, bunnies can go. Can I go. ship the ones in my yard over? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we have an owl who likes them, though. <laughs> who sits on our back deck and just looks around. <laughs> you don't need a signature yet. No, not oh, okay. owl. Just feedback okay. and comments. So. Well, good. Well, we look forward to, you know, as you make progress, an update, because I think this is, um, I think it's a very <coughs> exciting um, partnership and has, really makes a lot of sense. So thank you very much for your leadership. Exception. Okay, now we get to the little sparkling lights over there. This is a uh, <laughs> presentation on the use of electric scooters in South Burlington and a potential one year pilot. Did we get to demo that in the, in the room just a few times? Yeah, do we get to well, use I'm it? Welcome. <laughs> yeah, I rode the scooter and the bike, yeah. Now I'm thinking about getting a bike because, you know. An electric bike? Yeah. I'm checking it out. I, know. I would like to test Conversion to kits, too. So we do have a quick little presentation prepared for you guys. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Bob Dale. I am the community manager for Green Ride Bike Share uh, here in Chittenden County. Um, 
For those unaware, Gotcha, we are the developers and the operators of the current Green Ride Bike Share System here in Chittenden County. Um, and we're here to talk about uh, some possible um, expansion for the spring um, and our proposal for the possibility of a e-scooter pilot system, um, pilot program for this summer, um, plus a discussion about the conversion of our current bike fleet to electric bikes as well. So just to run through a few things really quick, I'd like to just give you guys a quick rundown on our current electric um, fleet assets that we have with Gotcha that we are proposing to introduce to Chittenden County uh, this year. So the current discussion right now, um, as a natural sort of evolution of the current bike share system, is talking about converting our current 107 105, excuse me, seven speed bikes to our new um, electric bikes. These are 100% electric um, e-bikes. These are pedal assist e-bikes. So for those unaware, there's two different styles of electric bikes out there. There is a pedal assist where the motor of the bike is actually driven by the pedals. Um, as well as throttle style electric assists that have an actual throttle just like our e-scooter here. Our bikes are a pedal assist, so the electric assist of the bike is based off of the torque of the pedals. Um, the, they are GPS enabled just like our current bikes. They have an IoT um, computer system inside the bike itself to allow users to unlock both the bikes um, and the scooters utilizing our own um, Gotcha app. We're now streamlining everything. Um, to date, we currently use Social Bicycles app for the current bikes out there in the bike share system. We now have our own Gotcha app, which will allow users just to download the one app um, to utilize any of our assets that we implement in our markets. Um, some more details on the bike. So this is the design of our new bike here. Um, like we said, it's got a, uh, a 350 watt electric motor in there, um, a front motor. Um, and brand new basket, front and rear lights, cup holder in the basket. Um, that's our great uh, new feature this year. Um, unlike the current bikes where the brain of the bike is in the back behind the seat, all of the brains of the bike now live up in the handlebar area. Um, util users just scan a QR code um, or they can utilize an RFID card to unlock bikes which is paired to an account. Um, if that person does not have a smartphone or would just like to use the RFID card. Um, a great new seat, an easy up style seat, so as opposed to the, you know, old school style sort of crank seat, it's just got a little handle that automatically um, is under compression, just lifts the seat. Um, it has a belt drive system, so no chain, so these things are able to live outside year round. Um, completely rust proof on all of the uh, features, as well as a solid tire, um, which kind of cuts down any punctures or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, so this is our new bike. We have the ability to do some sponsor branding on the basket, um, but all of the bikes will be swip swapping over to um, the gotcha teal green coloration. So we're still in talks with Ben and & Jerry's and 7th Generations, who are the current title sponsors. Um, about our relationship going forward and some um, sponsorship and branding opportunities for the new bike. Um, to give you guys a little bit of details on e-bikes in current markets out there, it really revolutionizes how bike share systems are used, especially other markets that have similar topographies here in Chittenden County, um, sort of hilly areas. The e-assist style bike really revolutionizes how users um, use the bikes. It really, really helps users have a actual alternative mean of transportation, which is the real, our real goal with a bike share system here in Chittenden County is to have a viable option for round trip transportation. Um, a lot of, you know, the barriers to use in areas like this is it's very easy to take, you know, a bike downhill. You end up down at the bottom of a big hill. You turn around and say, oh, you know, I may take the bus. Um, in downtown Burlington, for example, it's very easy to ride the bike straight down to the waterfront and then just hop on the free College Street shuttle back up. We really see the e-bikes completely revolutionizing how users um, utilize the bike share system, self-balancing a lot more. Um, right now we partner uh, with Old Spokes Home, who does a lot of our uh, mechanic work, um, but a big majority of their time is spent actually going around and moving, physically moving the bikes to have a balanced system. 
with the swap over to e-bikes, the increase in the number of hubs and the increase in the number of bikes, we really f see this expansion in the spring um, being a lot more self-balancing, um, a lot more healthy round trip style transport system. We'll get into the details on kind of the numbers of bikes and hubs in just a second here. What do they weigh? Uh, they're surprisingly light. The current e-bike right now is just a little over 50 pounds. 50. Um, the current bikes in the system are right around 42, 43, I believe, for our current seven suit bikes. You just mentioned the College Street Shuttle. There's a chance that's no longer going to be free in uh, about three or four months. Does that <laughs> benefit you? You'll have less people drunk ditching the bike and then taking the free shuttle? It very well could. Okay. Um, but yeah, like we said, uh, swapping over to the electric assist style bikes, you know, really makes it a, a really viable option, especially for those users who feel a little uncomfortable, you know, riding a seven speed bike. There's a huge increase in new ridership in bike share systems that have electric assist style bikes as well, which is a really interesting statistic. Um, there's a lot of people who either see themselves as incapable of actually getting around on the seven speed bike, so they don't even want to try it. Then when they find out it's an e-assist style bike, there's actually a lot of statistics behind first time um, new users actually getting into biking and having it as a transportation option, um, which is really cool. So the big uh, discussion is about scooters. So we have one of our new gotcha scooters right in front of you guys here. Um, so what we are proposing for this uh, upcoming summer season is to run a pilot program um, with these new e-scooters to implement them into the current um, bike share system. Um, to give a little bit of a rundown on these scooters, again, similar to the bikes, has a 350 watt motor, um, front and rear lights, very wide, stable base plate. Um, it's a very, very sturdy scooter. Um, we did a lot of testing as we were building the scooter. It's proprietary to Gotcha. We are the only company out there that has this particular style of scooter. Um, it is a very, very rugged scooter. Uh, there's a lot of issues with other companies out there with, you know, the actual construction of the scooters running into issues, getting into potholes, you know, the handlebars snapping off, et cetera, et cetera. This is actually a, a, a surprisingly sturdy scooter. Um, we did a lot, a lot of testing. I've been riding it around for the past few days, going pothole hunting with it. It, uh, it holds up. Huh. As you can see, it's You don't still have to go far, do you? Yes. There's no yeah. Yeah. yeah, that is true. <laughs> Um, and as you can see, it's still standing here. These um, good for something. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we so won't have to pave our roads. <laughs> yeah, <great. laughs> that's area. Well, that's why and another big, uh, you know, argument for getting a lot of the stuff out there is more vocal voice. You know, more more voices out there. It's for you know more bike and bike infrastructure. Um, just like the bike, all of the brains of the scooter are right near the handlebars. It has a QR code scanner to unlock the scooters, as well as RFID capability. Um, the RFID cards are a great way. Uh, we currently use them in markets for low income um, and non-banked users, non-smartphone users who can go to one of our facilities. We're going to foresee our continual partnership with Old Spokes and possibly some other businesses where someone can go in and almost prepay, um, add into their account, and then they're issued an RFID card so then they can go out into the system without a smartphone and utilize the bikes or the scooters. So from a user standpoint, like I said, we now have our own Gotcha app. Through that Gotcha app, from both a user and an administrative standpoint, we have a lot of flexibility with our systems now. Um, our whole tech team are based down in Charleston, South Carolina, so all this tech is in-house now, so any issues, you know, we, we're, I'm on the phone immediately now with our tech guys as opposed to outsourcing any of this tech in the bikes or the scooters. From a user standpoint, it's a very easy sign-up process. Um, we will still keep a similar um, payment structure. Um, there's the pay-as-you-go option where you do not actually have to be a member of the system or you can pay into a monthly or annual membership. Um, unlike the current um, system, it will now sort of be a per minute charge, um, which kind of encourages a little bit more of those shorter trips, which we are, you know, we really foresee these things being first and last mile transport options. Um, so it will be a per minute charge with a very small fee to just unlock either the bikes or the scooters. 
Once the user has downloaded the app, they will be able to see where all the bikes and scooters are in the entire system area. Um, it will automatically sort of zoom into where that user is. It will tell them exactly how far they are from any of the hubs um, that have either bikes or scooters. It will tell them how many bikes or how many scooters are at, are at that hub and the electrical charge on each of those bikes and scooters. Um, we are really expanding our operations fleet team this summer as well to be on top of things throughout the day, obviously converting everything to electric. There's a little bit more operation intensive side to make sure that all the assets out in the field are at a certain level of electrical capacity so no one's hopping on and having the scooter or bike die, you know, half a mile from where they started. Um, but back to the user standpoint, like I said, it can tell them exactly how far they are from any hubs. Um, it can give them walking directions to that hub. Once they're there, they can then either unlike, unlock the bike or the scooter um, while they're out riding. Um, or, uh, one thing I should mention, before that user unlocks a bike or scooter, um, there's a lot of educational pieces that we put through on the app um, for users. It, has, it forces them to scroll through a couple pages um, especially that can be especially catered to any of the markets we're in so one of our big ones we're currently down in Fort Lauderdale where we don't allow any scooters on the sidewalk so the first thing that pops up when someone is is unlocking a scooter big capital letters no fine print on this one it says you are not allowed to ride on sidewalks so they're with the cars they're on our streets so yeah they are in bike paths um, and out in the streets yes yes um, bike lanes bike lanes yes There is, you know, some user hazard if it's, you know, sometimes first time users not knowing exactly what they're doing, sort of weaving in and out a little bit. There definitely is that um, component a fair bit, but, uh, but ju you know, having these things live out in the areas just like b bicycles currently do, you know, it's, it's it really become a great option for people to go on these short little, you know, first and last mile style trips, which is really what we foresee the scooters being utilized and as. Just one person on it? Just you can't have person. your child stand in front of you? No. <laughs> no. Good. Because that's how they get around in Paris. I know, you might I see. know. They, yeah. they take their children to school on those scooters. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So right on the front, it's kind of hard to see for you guys, but we have some information right on the front base of the scooter right there. It says, always wear a helmet. You must be 18 years or older. That's another thing. It's 18 and up for both the bikes and the scooters, so there's an age verification that they have to go through while signing up, um, where they actually have to take a photo of a, an 18 or older ID. Um, but it also says one user at a time. Um, Tom, to your question about helmets, that's a big question. Every bike, sh every sharing you know, mobility company out there in the world is still yet to find a great answer. Um, to getting s helmets out on the sort of daily basis to users. Um, what we really try and do is, especially at the launch of any of these systems, um, we're very, very intensive about having a huge bank of helmets where if users sign up at any sign up events, we issue a free helmet. Um, we foresee partnering with local businesses so that users can either um, go in and purchase a helmet or the possibility of having a few localities where users can actually go in and get a free helmet. Um, there's a few companies out there who have tried sort of having banks of helmets living out there in some of the hub areas. That doesn't work. Um, you know, there's... You mentioned RFID tags to unlock the bike. You should attach those securely to helmets so they have to carry a helmet around to unlock their That's bike. not a bad idea. Not a bad idea at all. Um, from the user standpoint, from uh, the app side, just to wrap up this slide here, once uh, that uh, user has unlocked their bike or their scooter, um, like we said, we can utilize this app to send any kind of notifications to that rider um, on the charge of their asset. Another great thing that we can do from an admin side is we can geofence areas um, for a number of things. We can geofence no ride zones so if there are certain areas where we do not want bikes or scooters to go to, um, it will actually cut out the motor. Um, obviously, ah, with, the, with the bikes, the rider can still use it as a regular bike. Um, but with the scooters, they are sort of heavy enough so that once the motor cuts out, it's, it's 
not a great option for someone to continue scooting their way along. Um, so we are able to set up no ride zones. We are allowed. We are able to geofence speeds and govern the speeds on both the bikes and the scooters. So from the motor standpoint, the max speed on the bike is 20 miles per hour. The max speed on the scooters is 15. We have the ability to govern that for the entire fleet. We are allowed to. We are able to govern that speed in certain geofenced areas. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility from an operations standpoint. Um, on air, figuring out areas that we do not want to allow the bikes or scooters, um, governing the speeds in certain areas, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, once that person finishes up their ride, they can let us know how their ride was. It will give them all of their information on how long their ride was, how far they went, um, and how much they were charged. Um, right through that app as well, it's got direct lines to our customer service if they ever have any issues while they're out there. Um, we have 24-7 customer service. Um, that they can call, it goes straight to us. You know, if there's any issues while they're out there on a bike or scooter, we can be to them within a matter, you know, depending on where they are, um, with them in a matter of 20 minutes um, throughout Chittenden County, which is great. Um, so very, very smooth um, from a user standpoint. And like we said, streamlining it all through our own app now um, really helps sort of combine all of the, uh, all of the uh, assets we have out there. Um, so I just wanted to keep that kind of short to talk about the um, the hubs. What we currently do for hubs, um, I know one of the big uh, one of the big points of concerns from municipality standpoints for the scooters is a lot of the companies out there that have a completely free flowing style for their scooter share systems is the clutter of scooters. Scooters lying out on the sidewalk, scooters being propped up in front of businesses, scooters laying in front of entryways. Um, we utilize a hub style system for our scooters. So just like a bike share system, these scooters need to come back to an organized area. So we foresee partnering these scooter hubs with the current bike um, hubs we have in the system, as well as being able to you know, put around some more of these, uh, some scooter hub areas that can be you know, separate from the bike areas as well. But we do utilize a hub style system, keeps the system a lot cleaner, really cuts out the issues of the scooters just being ditched all over the place. Um, and it really helps from an operation standpoint to know where our scooters are living so that we can be right on top of fixing any issues with the scooters, making sure that the system is clean, aesthetically pleasing, um, and that we can make sure that all of our scooters are, you know, meeting that threshold of charge so that they're from an so operator. You're going to collect them every night and kind of get them back to the hubs? Yep. So the current plan, um, which we do in our other markets, is all of the scooters are brought in every night um, down in Fort Lauderdale. I believe they do that right around 10 p.m. Um, so that's another conversation to have um, is, you know, figuring out times of when we want all of the scooters brought in in the evening. They're charged in our facility, brought back out um, in Fort Lauderdale. We have them back out at 7 a.m. Throughout the day, we have an entire fleet team on throughout the day that's sort of monitoring the system. They can see if scooters are being left um, outside of hub areas, and then they'll be dispatched to bring those scooters back to hub areas making sure that the scooters out there in the system throughout the day are properly charged. Um, so yeah, the, the hub-based system definitely, from an operations and from a user standpoint, makes it a lot more organized style of a system. So what we're currently working on right now, um, we sort of see the conversion to the e-bikes as sort of a natural progression of the current bike share system that we have out in, um, in Chittenden County at the moment. We're talking about expanding the number of bikes to 200 e-bikes, so swapping over the, the entire current fleet to e-bikes and bringing that number up to 200 from the current 105 um, and going up to probably at least 25 hubs um, from the current 17 hubs that we have out there um, with the possibility of bringing scooters in um, this summer as a pilot program um, to give it a shot and uh, sort of see how things run. Um, the great thing about having a pilot program for the scooters is, you know, having them out there for the four months of the summer. That's another thing to talk about is that we will we only propose having these out during the warm months or during the beginning of winter. All the scooters are brought in. Um, the bikes will live outside 365. Yeah, so that is all I got. We, what was the bike usage this winter? It was 
it wasn't as high as we had hoped. Um, there was still a lot of usage on the university campuses. Obviously, the students still need to get to class all winter long. Um, and we had actually quite a bit of, uh, all, a, a majority of our trips during the winter, which was really good to see, is that a lot of our trips during the winter months were actual round trip, um, sort of transportation style trips. So a bike leaving Winooski Circle going into Burlington and actually returning um, to Winooski towards the end of the day, which was a great thing to see that there actually are you know, locals out there during the winter months utilizing this as a, as a transportation option. So Bob, how long have you been doing this? I came on board with Gotcha in October. So the bike share launched April 2018. I came in October 2018. <coughs> I was working for a company, Wind and Waves, down south. Oh, yeah. yeah. You graduated in what? 13? 2014. 14. I was a student of Dave's, by the way, everyone. Mm -hmm. Parks Rec and I tourism. assumed so, since he was asking personal questions. <laughs> oh, you Not thoughts, interviewing right? you for a job, but. <laughs> um, we also have Brian Davis here from the CCRPC. He's one of our partners. Um, so with Gotcha, we partner with. This is going to be done in probably f between four and eight weeks. So it's happening pretty quickly. If you look on the back of it, uh, we would want to know what people think about the current system and what they would like to see. So there is a short online survey open right now. There's also a crowdsource map where people can go in and drop pins. You know, I, I, would write, I would like a station here for these reasons, or I don't want a station here, or this is a biking barrier. Um, and when you open that map, you'll probably see 50 or 75 little pins on maps right now, which is great. So people are accessing it, and that'll be open for another week. -ish. That survey hit front porch forum today. Great. I'm glad. Do we have it on our website? I'll, I'll make sure that we do. Yeah. Because yeah. you know, in do the next know week, I won't be trying it out, so I wouldn't be able to fill out the survey. Okay. But you know, I I would like to get it yeah. out to whomever in South Burlington has tried it. Right. To give you some good feedback, I haven't. Yep. So I wanted to share sort of the RPC planning side of things, in mm -hmm. addition to you know how it Great. plays out with the proposal um, here as well. So, Paul, huh? just a couple of quick notes to add to what um, Brian and Bob had to say. One um, is that uh, we we've been pretty excited to be a partner with um, this whole project for the last three years. Um, as as Bob was saying, this really has the potential we think to be a game changer in the way that transportation starts to take place in Chittenden County. So uh, oftentimes when, we're, when we start talking about, say, the scooter share, it, st it starts to pop into how could somebody who say, I'm not going to um, say that necessarily this one location will have one, but let's say somebody lives in um, Old Orchard Park over by Lowe's and they work in Montpelier. Well, right now it's an obstacle to get over to Shaw's to then hop in the link bus. So now they could just pop over there in, with a, a bike or a scooter or something like that and make that trip that much easier. Or somebody who lives on Kennedy Drive and wants to go up to Price Chopper or Trader Joe's, it's a little bit far of a walk to do on a regular basis, but um, if it was uh, that quick and available, it's that quick short trip that could be uh, a really neat opportunity um, in our community. So that's one thing I want to mention too is that this has been a we really thank Brian for uh, a lot of effort in coordinating not just CATMA, UVM, Champlain College, but also um, three municipalities in Winooski, Burlington, and ourselves, and trying to keep us sort of all thinking in the same area has been very helpful. And then lastly, um, just a quick note on the finances, because we didn't talk about this. Uh, a year ago, when you last heard about this, there was a request to the council for, I think it was $10,000 last year. Um, the, correct me if I'm saying anything incorrectly here, Bob, but um, the whole universe of how these things um, are funded has changed in the last year. Um, from when two years ago we were looking at potentially $10,000 per hub as a contribution to $10,000 total last year to where it's going the other way around now. And um, part of the proposal includes a contribution from Gotcha to CATNA to help with um, uh, to help with uh, making transportation improvements due to a different model of user fees, sponsorships, and, uh, and I presume work in the data world and all that. So there is no ask of the city council in terms of funding for this this year. Well, what you would like is some guidance from us 
to direct you to wanted to on the scooter side um, it is it is something new um, it's a proposed one-year pilot um, if the council were so interested there is about a 90-day <coughs> time for gotcha to actually get the bikes built and so um, an indication from council that you're interested would also give us the time to update any ordinances that are necessary and um, work on some of the programmatic elements that um, Bob and Brian had spoken around um, around speeds and areas and that kind of thing. Okay. Well, let's do it. Let's no reason why not to. Right. Well, yes or no. <laughs> so <laughs> I second Dave's comment that I, that I met in Venice in Santa Monica. In between bird and lime bikes and scooters, right? I saw a lot of people using the scooters and the bikes in, in Santa Monica and in Venice on the bike paths. I also saw scooters trashed all over the place on the sides of the streets and in corners and intersections and in garbage cans and in dumpsters and just, you know, strewn out in the sand on the beach. So uh, some of those communities, I don't know what the status is there now, but this will be a small, you know, experiment. It's a... And so I, I support that, but I just I know that there are some horror stories out there where communities have been have just had a littering of scooters all over the place, and it's not a pretty scene. And to touch on that quickly, one of the differentiators, one of the big differentiators with Gotcha is that's unlike some of those larger companies out there that have the capital, who companies so there are some other companies out there that put a one month lifespan on their scooters that they put in certain markets and once those scooters are beyond that one month lifespan they honestly aren't they don't care what happens to it no, which leads solid to waste issue which leads to a lot of these scooters there are landfills full of yeah. scooters and other municipalities and markets um, that is not how we operate as a company um, we you know all each one of these things in our markets are, are our babies so we are out there you know maintaining these things and uh and it's a guarantee that you know none of these things are going to be ever left out in a municipality after they break down the streets we're not going to be I'm not going to be leaving you guys with landfills full of scooters or bikes we can guarantee you that well, well doesn't somebody have to pay with a credit card and if they don't <coughs> return or do what they're supposed to they get charged for it right yeah, so some, you know, even though users are some, you know, paying for those trips, if that scooter is gone beyond whatever that company deems as its lifespan, you know, sometimes they'll decommission them from their back end and just leave them out in the wild to, to do as they be. Well, I think it's worth um, a trial and a pilot to yeah, yeah, yeah. figure out if, in fact, it can be um, utilized here to the extent that it's a a business model that works. I mean, there's that part of it that you're testing too. Um, a comment yes, um, from Kathy? We spent a lot of time talking about this and everybody was a little bit skeptical of the scooters to start with just because of all the stories we've heard and seen. And, um, but we, we came down with the, uh, in, in the end thinking this, we're, they're gonna be scooters and e-bikes on our streets that are privately owned eventually. And this, this is a good opportunity to test it under conditions that can be controlled really well, like getting the scooters back to a hub at night rather than somewhere on the street, um, and controlling the speed uh, because you can, we can decide what speed we want on our, our streets or our sidewalks or our bike paths and that sort of things. And, and it gives us the opportunity to be part of the experiment and part of the design and have input. So um, Bikeped was in favor of this um, right. pretty unanimously as long as we can straighten out the laws that need to be in place. Right. Right. Um, uh, one, we thought, for example, South Burlington shouldn't allow scooters on, on sidewalks. Uh -huh. um, E-bikes are not allowed on sidewalks, um, all of the bikes by state law are. But there's certain things like that. And then other signage that would probably be needed to remind people um, on the bike path what's allowed and what isn't and that sort of thing. So we, as long as those things can be accommodated, we thought it was a great idea. And if you haven't tried one, really fun. So I have a question for Paul. Yeah. Before we um, activate a pilot program, 
do we need to change some ordinances uh, to there allow are two, that? Or? There are two ordinances that our uh, city attorney, Andrew, has been uh, taking an initial look at. It's also part of the work that the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission is doing. Mm -hmm. is helping all three municipalities um, to take a look. But there's our parks ordinance, which covers the red path, and our highway <coughs> transportation ordinance. Um, both of them may need some minor adjustments okay. to them, um, and it gives us the opportunity to think about some of the things that Kathy has mentioned. So, so Andrew would be able to prepare that prior yes, there to is some this launch, right? And the, the 90 days gives us that time to do that as well. Okay. Um, and the is it tool design who's doing some of this work? Right, to, uh, the consultant is tool design doing this study, and that was one of the first tasks that we wanted them to do was look okay. at the state language, look at the three municipalities their language and so that's already been underway in, oh, okay, in anticipation right. so that um, if the council were to say yes that we're not caught behind well that sounds good are there other comments or questions David how big is gotcha so we have a few different branches of our company the mobility side uh, we're based out of South Carolina we also do um, some advertising as well so from the mobility side uh, we have currently 50, a little over 50 systems nationwide. Yeah. And, uh, By 50 systems, you mean cities where these are located? Correct. So uh, this would be cities, one system? Cities, university, campuses. Three, yeah. Yeah. three towns, but one right. system. Okay. Yes. Yeah, just, UVM is on board with this. They're doing these things. <laughs> the conversation around the scooters with the universities is, is ongoing. Um, especially, you know, trying to figure out areas on the campuses of where to allow, where to not allow. Um, not so in the halls. The <laughs> you may not drive these up the stairs and down your uh, <laughs> dormitory hall. Our biggest challenges are, uh, well, seasonality has got to be a challenge, whether you can make the, the numbers work given our seasonality and that our road system wasn't built to accommodate bicycles and scooters. That's right. Our road system is a big deal. So move. I would hope from a safety perspective that we don't see a, a, you know, you got more people riding bikes and scooters and too many people texting while they're driving and the two don't go very well together. And I guess we'll find out. I've seen both. But texting while biking, texting while scooting, and texting no while driving. No way. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. While biking? Oh, yeah. While biking? Well, go to you now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know, it's second nature. The right hand is glued, you know. Go to, go to, go to Europe. All right, let's um, well, keep focused, here. guys. Um, so you have a question. I'm One sorry. Quick question, sorry. So if you're using a cell phone, right, so you have to have some data to do the activation. When it reads the QR code, does the app decode the QR code or send the image and then your back server decodes it? Do you know? So once the IoT system inside the scooters and bikes decode and unlock the, the assets right then and there, yeah. But if you take your phone and you, and you take a picture of the QR code, it's got to go through the cell network back to your server. And right. it, so are you right. sending the picture that the person took or is the app decoding the QR code and sending the digits of the, the serial number of the, of the, you don't know? That... I do not know a specific, okay. specific so answer to that. So the point I'm trying to make here, which <laughs> yes. is that... What is the point? So the, the, the point is, is that cell phones are becoming... Well, they're already ubiquitous, right? Mm -hmm. And they're becoming more and more important for municipal uh, infrastructure communication, right? And not everybody can afford a data plan. Some cell phone plans are really, really expensive, and, and some are less expensive. But the point is there's a lot of data that needs to be shipped around to do really tiny little things. Like, in order to activate that thing, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's an infinitesimally small amount of data that has to go somewhere over a cell network, right? Along with probably using your shout, ride, ride shout or whatever it is, your app. Right, yeah. So the point is that there are all these little tiny little apps that don't use very much data, and it's almost like like the, regula the regulatory policy should be that for people that are using those types of things where not much data is passing, is it should be free, you know, or it should be subsidized by some thing in our governance system so that anybody that has a cell phone that needs to be able to use transportation that's provided by you know, county, you know, infrastructure or, or regional infrastructure or anything having to do with, with non -watch, not watching videos of, you know, the NCAA basketball, but, but necessary 
things for you to live your life, right, that are about transportation, health, things like that. Those, and if they transmit small amounts of data, it should be free. You shouldn't even need a data plan for it, you know. But, um, okay, I'm off Can my You talked to some of the presidential <laughs> candidates. Yes. That sounds like a federal uh, issue. I, I or maybe state. Yeah. These things have data plans, right? So. You, can you activate it with a credit card directly on the device, or you need a smartphone or a password? No, so unlike the current bikes where, you know, you, well, even with the current bikes, you know, you still need to go through either on a computer or on your phone and, and put in your information. Except for the RFID tag you were Except talking about. Except with the prepay RFID option, right. which they do, all of these do it, yeah. So for those without a phone, they could get those RFID things, and that could give them access to this device. Well, we'll probably cross that bridge when it becomes really popular, and we need to. Donna, you have a final comment? Uh, yeah, just a, a final comment, and this is something the city really does have to uh, consider, and that is the real significant importance when you have both bikes and scooters on roadways to have the fog lines and the center lines pinned yes. mm -hmm. as early in the year as possible, because a lot of the roads are perfectly capable. I mean, we have 30-foot roadways. A lot of them are 30 feet wide. You know, it's per perfectly possible to have a 30-foot a 10-foot um, drive lane and a 5-foot bike lane on those roadways. And that helps define where people are going to feel comfortable mm -hmm. using an e-bike or a scooter on a road. Yes. Whereas other places where you may only have like a 24-foot wide road, if, if you don't have a fog line there, you're not going to feel comfortable right. necessarily, you know, taking a bike on that road. I'm, I'm glad Donna brought point, that up. Point well taken. Because I actually meant to state at the outset of the meeting that the Will Williston Road, where we have that jog to the right before we cross the interstate, that there should be arrows right at that curve to have the drivers follow those arrows. It's especially when we're considering having right. even yeah, they're more pretty worn out this yeah. this right. time of year. Right, and I don't think there ever were arrows right there. So I think we really need to steer people because we have a lot of out of towners right there at that yeah. intersection oh, yeah. all the time. So and apparently there's yeah. a lot of competition to get those lines painted. There's a limited number of companies that do it. Right. So you know we have to get in there a lot earlier, and you know and maybe it's going to cost a little more money to get it done soon, but it's better to get as much as we can done uh, rather than wait until September or October is. That has been happening. Sure. Last year, some of it didn't happen at all. That's that's tough. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have what you need, Paul? We have what we need. Okay. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you, you very you much. Good to see you, Bob. Well I'm going to have <coughs> called just for a very brief um, break so um, Sue can get warmed up, I guess, and because we just really have two quick items, so. Can I'd like to call back into session the South Burlington City Council meeting of April 1st, 2019. <coughs> and we'll take up item 12, which is convening as a South Burlington Liquor Control Commission. I move to convene as the South Burlington Liquor Control Board. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So we have quite a list. I, I'm not going <laughs> to read them all off. There's just a... <laughs> A bunch of, are there any questions? No. Let's screw them all up and turn it down. <laughs> uh, I, think I this actually had one question. And that was, if you recall, or at least one of the things that I always look, up, look at to see if they've had their licenses suspended or got caught for DUI or whatever, it's one of the check marks you have to. And in the past, the valleys, you know, Skip Valley who owns gas stations. Gas stations. A few. In the past, they've always checked that yes, and then you go to the list, and there's a whole list of them. It goes back quite a few years, but there have been some in you know recent, mostly speeding. But I don't know. It just is a character kind of thing, I guess. And this year, they didn't check off yes; they checked off no. So Let's pull those. <clears throat> Well, I'm just curious if there's a, um, like, a statute of limitation. So if they haven't been arrested for anything, <laughs> you know, um, 
for it five the same years. Signature, it was the same person who was I, lying. I believe so. Is that Jolly's? There's like five. No, people it's not on that. Jolly's. It's um, what is it called? Um, Maplefields. Maplefields. Oh, Maplefields. Uh, you know, I just raised that as just a point of interest because that was a, a difference. And then my other question is, you have to be convicted of something before you check that off, right? Because there is an issue. I would think so. With the rotisserie. Yeah. Yes. But that hasn't gone to court yet, I don't think, unless someone is aware of that. So I won't flag them. But I, I mean, I, I think. We can pull it, yeah. have it investigated. That's our job, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, yeah. You just want to make it have a check, sure. Yeah, sure. I was just curious. Yeah. We want an honestly filled out application, right? You have the yeah. steel trap of a memory, what? like That's no just, one else. Just one of those things that I always look at. <laughs> so which one are we pulling out? Maple Fields. Maple Fields. But I didn't see anything else that, um, oh, I know, the other one, Club 35. Now that's the one that's on the, that's um, the Vermont National Guard. It's what? the club that's on National Guard Drive. I just was curious, is that the one, I mean, everyone can go to it, right? It's not a- well, It's not the officer's club? The off it, I, I don't know, it was just a question I had. Right. And I didn't know was the that, was, answer. Was there application in there? Yes. Did it, did it have an address like? It did, let me- Is that the Army National Guard Club? It's on NCD. And then, so I think that's the, I don't know what that stands for, but then you you read through it and it was, it's the one on um, on the base or what, close to it or something. What page in our packets, Helen? Where, how far down is that, do you know? No, I don't know. I'll um, have to find it. Really Did you raise a concern with it? Just with what was in the press is where you're coming from? Um, no, the concern I would raise is there were apparently two places where they, and one didn't allow women, as at least that's what it, has, it allegedly hasn't allowed women. You know, it was just for the officers, I guess. And I mean, I just, I didn't know if that was the one. And that's a- There was the viper Somewhat of a concern of mine. I, I, you know, if we're gonna yeah. give them a liquor license, it should be sort of open to everyone on the base, I would think. Right? It, it's if there was a club in town that didn't allow women, I'd probably be interested, yeah. The, the no liquor more. license, I think, is really only for, for, the ability of, for their ability to purchase liquor at wholesale prices from the state. I don't think it's really, because they, they don't serve. Well, uh, that was my question. I yeah. mean, I, I just didn't know which one this was. So it's not the first set, because it's th um, something, thir Club 35. It's the first class license list, okay. Oh, VT Club 35 at hotmail.com. First class NCO means they drive. serve. Um, they first serve. First class means they serve, they pour. Yeah. They yeah. pour uh, mixed drinks, yeah. It's not just beer and wine. This has Club 35 directors, Rousseau, Goodrich, Leclerc. What page is that, do you know? Matthew Powell. What page of the PDF are you on there, Tim? Uh, it's, it's hard to tell. Be, uh, one, one fif go to page 158. 158. Or 157. Okay. 105 NCO Drive. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I just raised that as a question. I don't know. Exactly, I don't know what one, where 105 NCO Drive is, but it does say first class club located in a single story wooden building located on the Air National Guard base. On, on the Air National Guard base? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, That's what it says, description of the premises. And the lessor is the city of Burlington. You know, in that VT Digger um, article, there were references to some intoxication Mm -hmm. That occurred on the base, or there, you know, there were either rumors or stories about it. I don't know if they're substantiated or not, but um, you know, 
That calls into a really good question is that if there was an indication that something would happen, how could it be investigated because you can't get on the base, right? <laughs> right. So, so, so uh, I, I don't know. Do our police and fire chiefs walk through these facilities as part of the uh, application process for a first they class? They do, yep. So they have do you know to. if they have walked through Club 35? Uh, that should be on there, on the sheet. Uh, it says, <coughs> it's signed, wait, there's a signature in there, hold on, right? About I don't see the email. Um, okay, wait. Edward Spooner signed off on. Yeah. All right, well. Let's pull it. Sure. Let's well, there's, okay, so there's a signature by, yeah, Ed Spooner. That, but not Chief Burke, so just Edward Spooner. Right, and there's no email about it either, so. I mean, so that just raises a really good question, right? And I, I hate to discriminate like this, but we have <laughs> alcohol regulations for a purpose, right? And if our alcohol regulations have no effect on a on a you know, on Air National Guard base, then why are they even applying for an alcohol license in the first place? That's I just don't understand. And if they are, then we should be allowed to inspect the premises, right? And if we can't inspect the premises, then we can't meet the qual the qualifications or criteria for giving the license. Why are we giving the license in the first place? So. It's just a thought. It's a good thought. So why well, don't shall we, we pull that oh, one and sure. get some more information? Okay. Sure. I mean, there's no reason why not, and these renew. I think May first, you said, Tom, right? Yeah. So we got another I meeting between. Still put it on the next oh, one yeah. and Maples. Okay. Yeah. Well, my question stands, and I think I heard you say yes, Tom. But when they signed this document, when Edward Spoon signs this document, did he inspect it this yeah, year? Like they have physically walk physically through. physical inspection once a year. Yeah. Let, let's thought. let's yeah. hear about that. I want to I want to know for a fact that that happened. Yep. Okay. Well, and I would like to know if this is open to all the um, yep. okay, no, people no, 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 who too. work on the base, mm -hmm. sure. or if it's the one that seems, at least it's been reported that it has a, um, a limited membership, shall we say. Well, they could feel free to come in and and. and Wasn't it for the officers, them. too, and not for... Yeah. It would you know, be... Yeah. 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 And I think there are typically officers' clubs, yeah. you know. But, I, but the other one again, the why do they need our li liquor license? I mean, I guess we make a little money on it. <laughs> guess what I just I said. Just, I just recall yeah. there were two on the base, and there was one that was the problem. I don't remember the names yeah. from these articles. Um, the other one's Maplefield. But we yes. want us to learn a little bit more how the process is working. We have to sign yeah. these things, so we should provide oversight. Okay. Questions. Let's so ask questions. I would entertain a motion to approve all of the second-class liquor licenses and all of the first-class licenses, with the exception of Club 35 for the first class and um, Maplefields Maple for the second-class license. A move. Second. Okay, any discussion? No. All in favor, say aye. 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 I move to come out of the uh, South Burlington Liquor Control Board. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. Okay, we are back into our regular session. We are now on to other business. So the first item is um, <coughs> we need to make a motion, I guess I can move, that the City of South Burlington um, agree to contribute. Well, 20? agree to have a hearing. Do we have to have a, a warning? No, we don't have to have a hearing, but we have to warn a discussion, it's, right? Right. So we so need to have for a. For ratification. For ratification yep. Yep. Um, of an expenditure of $20,000 to support the viewing the project yeah. purchased through. Nature Conservancy. The Nature Conservancy in Shelburne. 20000 would be out of the open space fund. Right, and right. we would uh, sort of we're sort of warning it. And, right? and one fifth of the property is in South Burlington. Right, it's that Shelburne Pond. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, right near Shelburne so Pond. So we're warning this for action um, at our. Yeah, I guess it's a, is it a hearing? It's just an agenda item. Uh, 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 official think, agenda. Official item. agenda item. For April fifteenth. You don't even really 15th. need a vote. You just need a consensus from us to do this. But yeah, second the motion I heard. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, then the second item 
um, we certainly had some, not discussion, but um, several um, letters that uh, Megan wrote uh, re um, involving our relationship and some of the challenges with the school board and their um, concerns with, with how we have gone about making decisions and working with them and um, I would, I agree with um, Councillor Emery that it would be really helpful to have um, a steering committee meeting with the school board and the full council as well as the um, senior leadership yes. from both um, the school and, and the city of South Burlington because some of the communication is between them as well to really discuss this and um, come to hopefully some better understanding um, of our relationship and how we can better communicate beyond the kind of steps that Bridget and I talked about. We can talk about those and see how to articulate that better and really get past this seemingly long, endless, emails of, well, this is how I feel and this is how you feel and, and get, get to the bottom of it because it's really important for city center and the health of this community. Understanding the timeline pressures, I support if it can come together this week, but I know we were talking about next week as well, but I, I would just say uh, sooner the better. Yes. Okay. Well, I will. Um, and more than an hour. It should be at least three hours. Oh, I, I think really it needs to be a couple yeah. hours. With yeah. food. With food. Yeah. Yeah, we can make it. We can make it a potluck. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I will um, make that invitation, extend that invitation to Elizabeth and David and find out if they can um, come up, if they agree and what dates might work. Okay. Or maybe you can follow up with the dates, but I'll send, yeah. I'll, I'll CC you on the okay. email. I, also, I should hope they agree. Well, we need it in a timely way as well, so. Yeah. So I would hope they would as well. Okay, any other um, new business or other business? Uh, I am out. Uh, the, next time. Uh, ten, wait, the, I'm out the 10th to 17th, so the next so meeting I will be 15th. here. I want to say one thing. It, this is not warning. It's just something on my mind. Carol McKillian called me from Common Roots, and she said the Wheeler property is like ready to start hosting events. And I would love, and I might just start doing this if counselors want to get on board and help me with this, but I would love to do an appreciation event for the DPW. This was a hard winter. I'd love to give them just a barbecue right before a Bikes and Bites at the Wheeler property one time. So just invite the Department of Public Works, all the employees. I'm, I'll serve up the burgers and cook it for them right before a Bikes and Bites just so that they know that we appreciate everything they did this this summer, uh, this winter, and also all that they do all year long. I'm glad you brought that up because we had talked about that instead of doing it at the holiday time to yes, do it in the spring. It, and then oh. we wanted yeah. to have all the um, the contracts finished, and they are, are they not? We have a tentative agreement. We have a tentative yeah, agreement. So. so, and I, I actually like your idea of doing the the baseball game too. Not that I'm a big baseball fan, but that's another way to. To show our appreciation because they to do. support the lake monsters <laughs> right all right well let's um not forget that let's plan can that. we put that on the agenda yeah yeah that would be good we could have that as an yeah. agenda item okay. next time okay great thank you tom Adjourned. all right um motion to adjourn, motion to adjourn. okay all in favor Aye. Aye. thank you very much gang Aye.